Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our um, attendees this morning, this morning for me as anyway. It is Friday, it's the last day of our lunch conference and we are starting with our laboratory committee meeting. Uh, you can find the agenda posted at conference.loink.org. Attendees, you will be on mute during the webinar. However, our team will be able to mute and unmute you if we need to engage in direct discussion with the committee members or other speakers. You can always submit questions into the Q&A function at any time, and your chat should be disabled. Presenters and committee members, we do ask that you raise your hand so we can designate you as a panelist. This will allow you to mute and unmute yourselves, turn your video on and off, and present if you do have uh, presentation materials to share. You'll be able to use chat directly. Please ignore that um, glaring typo that I now see on my screen with other panelists. And you'll be able to also respond to questions in the Q&A. If you have any uh, issues, concerns, um, trouble with the platform, please let us know at meetings at loinks.org. We are encountering an update with our some of our team members. So um, it's possible that there may be an update, a Zoom update that you may have as well. Okay, so with that, I am going to hand over to Pam, who is our committee chair, to start us off. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of uh, starting points here. Um, this is one of two public meetings that we have uh, each year. <clears throat> and so um, we also meet monthly as the committee, but that's a, those are closed sessions where we um, really dive in on things. But this is the opportunity each year for the committee to hear ideas from the public. Um, and it, really kind of any topic and you can submit those uh, to the email address that's uh, lab committee at loink.com or loink.org um, that we would be able to add to an agenda. I'm going to ask though at this moment if anyone of the public um, has a burning topic that they might be able to describe uh, and they would like to have a little bit of time on the agenda because we do have some open time today. Um, if you if you have anything that you would like to have added to the agenda, if you would please uh, type it into the Q and A box at this moment. And then I also wondered if we wanted to agree on having a bio break at the ninety minute mark. We can certainly work that in, Pam. Yeah. <laughs> when it when it seems natural around that time, we can work in a, a break. Absolutely. And your background is lovely. Thank you. Let's see that one. That one is Singapore, the botanical gardens. So does it seem to be stabilizing, April, on the number that are coming in? Um, so far, yes. I think we are good, and we don't have any uh, Q and A. So no current walk-ins for our agenda. Um, as far as committee updates go, I did receive information um, and we'll be having the platform open for David Bayorto to talk about value set work group, the new work group that's formed. Maureen Slackway, uh, one of our newer uh, committee members, was going to talk about uh, Loink at her organization, Universal Health Services. And then I had also asked a couple of questions of our national reference labs as far as the um, Oh, I think that's actually on the agenda. The adoption of their send out labs and maybe get an update on how their adoptions are going. Yes, that is on the agenda. All right. So with that, I understand that Swapna is on and she will be leading the first discussion instead of Jamie for the order codes and multi-gene studies. Yes, that is correct. And we're actually gonna be uh, sort of working together. So. Um, it will be both of us. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And we're starting off with uh, an easy topic. No, I'm just kidding. It's actually, <laughs> this one's actually really challenging. Um, and I think we'll take quite a bit of discussion. So am I showing the correct screen? I don't know where my green outline is. We see a yes. uh, link discussion. Should link have different order yep. codes? Okay, perfect. Um, okay. So uh, again, welcome to the lab meeting. And this is the first of uh, several topics that I think will spur some interesting discussion. Um, 
And so this particular discussion topic is regarding whether we should make uh, different like order codes for studies, uh, genetic studies that target multiple genes and conditions. And to give a little bit of background, um, a lot of companies offer lots of different versions of genetic tests for different types of carrier and cancer screenings that just vary in terms of the number of genes or conditions that are tested for. And what actually spurred this discussion topic was that we got a request from uh, the company Natera uh, for several of their tests. One is in the Empower uh, test group, and that's for hereditary cancer testing. And they basically have three different tests. Uh, one targets 19 genes, one is 40, and one is 53. And then uh, you can see the first one specifically is geared towards breast, ovarian, endometrial, cancer, and Lynch syndrome. And then the next two are multi-cancer, but the third one is actually called expanded. Um, and then their other product, Horizon, or one of their other products, um, that's related to carrier testing. And you can see they have a wide variety of panels to choose from, anywhere from four conditions to 274 conditions. Um, and then they have, you know, specific ones for different ethnicities as well. And so we were looking at this request and just, you know, talking internally and not quite sure how to approach it. And so we wanted to bring it to the lab committee. Um, there's links to um, other examples and we could look at some of these, but I'm not sure it's really necessary. I feel like the Natera one kind of, you know, brings it home in terms of the uh, variability. And we do have some more examples later on in the document, but um, you know, if you look at different like integrated genetics and Eurofins and GenPath diagnostics, um, they have lots of different varieties of uh, different panels that they offer that again, differ in terms of number of genes, number of conditions. Um, you know, a lot of them use the pan-ethnic or extended or, or expanded. Those two words are seem to be interchangeable. Um, but anyway, so let's see. So as I mentioned, each test can vary in terms of the number of genes or conditions tested, the population. So for example, pan-ethnic, um, some of them specify Ashkenazi, and then you know most of them don't specify a population. And then there's the standard screening versus extended or expanded. Um, in terms of what we have currently in LOINC, we have four, well, we have three codes that actually say multi-gene analysis in them. And then we have this older term, the 73977-1, it's cancer-related large-scale gene targeted mutation analysis. And it says large-scale in the component, but that's not actually defined uh, anywhere, like in the term description, though the term was created and it says in the term description for tests that targets over 700 mutations in 44 genes. Um, and we actually don't have any other, like we don't have a code for small scale or any other scale that I could find. And Jimmy, correct me if I'm wrong about that. That's right, yep. Um, but then more recently, we've created these three that are more condition-based. So coronary heart disease, multi-gene analysis, Ehlers-Danlos, and primary uh, hyperoxaluria. Uh, and those can be used across labs because different labs probably do, um, you know, test different genes or there's probably some overlap, but different, um, different methods and uh, different subsets of genes are probably tested. So let me stop there for a second and see just if anybody has any questions or wants to look at some of these other examples. I don't have a question, yeah. Swapna, but I do have a comment that uh -huh. I like. I like the way this is going, going forward with the conditions that you've started at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we at LabCorp, you've referenced a couple of our uh, panels, the integrated genetics. We are in that space of next-gen sequencing, and it's a growing area for us. And so we really, you know, like you said, we don't have the loink to be able to right. put on every gene that we have. So the conditions is definitely, um, I feel like, a good way to go. And uh, we get questions a lot. Um, why don't you have a more specific loink 
for your molecular testing. So uh, I think this is a space, obviously, that would be good to grow in. Right. Great. Thank you for that. This is Andrea. I just want to um, ask some questions and maybe you're going to get to this, but uh -huh. there, for genetic testing, it's kind of a harder beast, as you indicated, because you have some historic links like BRCA1, 2 for specific markers that you can map to a specific one-to-one -one for, you know, a biomarker panel, for example. But then you also have others um, aligned with the clinical genomics work group for like um, NGS and whole exome sequencing that is more generic and kind of like right. gene analyzed and you fill in the blank. So it can apply to many, many different types of markers, genes, whatever, with that kind of modeling. So there's kind of a mix of LOIC codes. The question I have is, um, you know, I, I like the um, idea of the problem or diagnosis or that you're looking at with some of the newer ones. But then there's also some markers that could be for multiple problems. So I think KRAS can be different cancers, for example. So I guess, you know, it's kind of, do you have a philosophy about which way you're kind of leaning as more problem diagnosis based as you have with the 93,000 examples on the screen? Or if you're going to look at specific markers, because I could see pros and cons of each. Um, yeah. From an individual marker perspective, there's, you know, we talked in chemistry about um, orders and not um, making order links for every single combination of chemistry tests, for example, that could be in mm -hmm. a chem, like a chem 20, because it could vary from each lab. So the, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if there's a new marker that's just, you know, discovered tomorrow, is it something right. that it can kind of be more generic by the problem and you can utilize it kind of like what um, Leanna was talking about, especially if you have lab developed tests um, or, you know, kind of what you're thinking philosophy wise too and approach wise. Yeah, exactly. And so you, you know, you sort of are predicting the future here. So <laughs> I was going to get to that in a couple of minutes. But in general, in like basically what we've done is if there's up to three genes or not just in the genetic space, like in micro or in chemistry, if there's up to three analytes, then we specify the actual analytes in the component. And so if it's BRCA1 and 2, those terms would still say BRCA1 and 2, or if there's a new one, you know, for KRAS or whatever, some new gene comes along and people are specifically testing that gene uh, by itself, then we would still make those specific blank codes based on, uh, on the gene being tested. Um, but then usually if it's more than three analytes, one, because then it becomes sort of impractical to put, you know, everything in a one component, but then because at that point it also does become more condition focused um, if you're testing for multiple things. So then we start naming things according to the condition uh, that's being tested for rather than, you know, naming 20 different genes um, in the in the component. So yeah, but I agree with you. And I think we'll still have a mix. Um, but I think, you know, we need to have some flexibility in terms of, you know, having both models uh, because sometimes they're only looking at one specific gene and you're right, like it could be in a number of different contexts. And so in those cases, we want the gene specific link code. Um, but okay. Okay. Um, actually just Dan's had his hand up for a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if you want to oh. go ahead and. Sorry, I didn't. You had a comment now or. No, no, you're good. Um, I, you answered part of it, which I was going to ask. Um, if you could explain a little bit more about the current models, because I think that would be helpful, and you, you did. Um, the, my question was um, whether you, you mentioned those three bullets, each test can vary in terms of number of genes, uh, population, and standard versus sort of ex extended, expanded. Yep. Um, is there another nuance difference between number of things tested and this standard versus extended expanded or are those kind of just uh, blocks you know or, or variants on the same the same theme yeah you know we've been trying to figure out that question and I'm not entirely clear on that you know it seems like it's basically and actually I have some examples down below that I can just sort of flip to for a second but um like for these Natera ones, you know, they have a 40 gene multi-cancer that's their sort of standard and then a 53 gene multi-cancer that they call expanded. And then in another case for, um, 
here for carrier screening, you know, it's 106 versus 274. So I think it really depends on the context. Um, but I think it is more like basically more genes equals ex expanded or extended. But mm -hmm. one of the issues that I was going to bring up was, well, what if, you know, what if next year they come up with a test that has 500? Well, what are we going to call that then, you know, super extended or? Plus, <laughs> extended plus, 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 plus. No. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, no, but that's okay. That that's helpful. I was I was curious whether there was some other thing about complexity of the testing or you know something else. But if it's really kind of about the the you know the number of either well, conditions in their proxy you know genes, then that at least narrows the dimension to sort of one. So thanks. I appreciate. Sure. That. Yeah. And it seems to be the number at least at this point in what we've seen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Stan also has his hand raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so thinking about sort of the clinical, the clinical use of these, my, what, what I'm thinking is that, you know, you'll have people or maybe even better uh, programs at some point that are going to look at uh, the patient's symptoms and, and maybe family history and other things and, uh, or, you know, other kinds of laboratory tests. Uh, and then what you want to do is, is have a way to know then what to order, you know, to confirm or further, further delineate the, the, the genetic situation. And so, um, and it seems like it's going to be variable enough that, you know, probably naming based on the situation is better than the chem seven example or the chem 20 example where you're doing when it's when it's small enough and 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 not varying not changing a lot over time then uh knowing knowing the exact contents at a computable level is you know you know that if for whatever reason you were you were going to order a cholesterol uh, but it's already part of a chem 20 that's ordered you can do uh, you can say i don't need to order a, a different an independent cholesterol because it's part of the chem 20 right. but with these very large sets i don't think i don't think that applies you, you're not uh, or if i think yeah my my thinking i guess is towards having the names be descriptive of the situation when you want to order this recognizing that the set of things in there may change uh, by different uh, laboratories and and change over time as there's greater knowledge about what you should order for um, coronary heart disease etc exactly yeah i completely agree and um, another example so for breast cancer screening i found out that you know, sort of depending on where in the country you live, they tend to order different panels, you know, but they're all you know, genes for like breast cancer. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just sort of interesting because it can vary, but really it should have the same order code. Um, and yeah, and sometimes, I mean, I think clinicians may not even know exactly what's in the panel when they're ordering it too. So it's, yeah, it's interesting how it varies. Um, so much across labs and regions also. And Swapna, there was just one comment from Brittany uh -huh. from Mayo. She yeah. said that Mayo trends towards grouping multi-gene panels by condition or disease. And yes, Brittany, we have noticed that with yes. Mayo, that they tend to. I yeah. think these might have all I, been created for you guys. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. I, do, I think they have, you do have an um, AML panel where there's like a four gene and an 11 gene. But other than that, yeah, um, it, that's what we've noticed. So thank you for that comment. Um, OK, so let me let me go on to the issues then. So I mean, we basically we've talked about some of these already. So you know, some of the issues that we faced are orders that are pretty much exactly the same, except for the number of genes that are tested. And then um, another interesting issue is orders for specific populations, like specific ethnicities. And I was looking, and so far in LOINC, we actually don't have terms that are created for specific 
ethnic groups. I think we have synonyms because like I looked for Ashkenazi and I found, you know, a set of terms. So we must have synonyms or in the description somewhere. Um, we must have certain keywords, but we don't have it in the actual, you know, like term. Um, the third issue, you know, what exactly does expanded or extended mean? Uh, Dan, the question that you, that you brought up and, you know, should we include words like this in the loin component? If it's sort of well-defined in the industry and has a particular meaning, then maybe yes, but otherwise, you know, like we're talking about, you know, otherwise in the future, are we gonna get requests for super extended or expanded plus or, you know, whatever. Um, and then we've also seen an interesting situation where there's, you know, they'll have a panel for carrier screening, but then they'll say, okay, so this is a multi-gene carrier screening plus SMA or plus fragile X or plus SMA and fragile X, which to me is kind of interesting because if it's already multi-gene, I don't know why those aren't just, you know, like included as part of the multiple genes. Um, but anyway, that was another issue that we ran into. So maybe let me go through the proposals and then I have some tables that show basically how different tests across different labs, uh, how those would map to proposed uh, like components. And so here's the proposal. So basically, um, as I mentioned before, we would continue to create codes defining up to three genes tested. So like the BRCA1 or two. And then above three genes, we're proposing creating codes based on the condition and then you know, possibly included expanded or extended, um, but not on the number of genes. So we would never create codes that say cancer screening, you know, 19 multi-gene analysis or 43 or whatever, because the other thing is the 19, like there may be 19 gene panels that are completely different across two different labs. So that wouldn't make any sense. Um, you know, one sort of corollary question is, should we include the population in the component? Um, multi-gene will include all the genes studied, so we wouldn't make separate codes for multi-gene plus SMA or multi-gene plus SMA plus fragile X. And then essentially, uh, labs could use additional codes to report the specific number of genes, which ones were tested, which specific conditions, like because these will say carrier or cancer screen, you know, so the specific um, conditions that were targeted. And then, of course, document everything in the user's guide. And so I have a couple, I have two tables. One basically has examples of proposed components for cancer testing. And then the other one is for carrier testing. And the color coding essentially shows that for these four rows, for the four rows that have this in blue, they would have the same blank order code. And so if we go with this approach, so saying, you know, hereditary cancer, multi-gene analysis, this Natera 19 gene, 40 gene, and then the integrated genetics 27 and 25 gene would all have the same. Uh, link code. And these are kind of interesting because here, like, so the difference between this Natera one, this is the expanded one. So this, if we decided to put expanded into the component, then this would have a different link code. But then this integrated genetics one is interesting because it's basically, it's the same panel as above, but without BRCA. And so, you know, in link, we would probably never say hereditary cancer or multi-gene except for BRCA1 and 2, you know, analysis, because um, we don't we don't put in sort of the negatives. But at the same time, I mean, how do you distinguish these? Um, and I guess, you know, maybe Leanna, this is a question for you. Like if we had the same order code for these two panels, would you know, would you be able to use that? Absolutely. Um, and again, you know, it's not so much from our side um, I really look to the industry from the interoperability. Are they going to be happy with seeing that? Because we can have, as you just tapped into our VistaSeq panels, um, we have several of those that may vary just with, you know, very few genes in between them. But, you know, from an ordering perspective, the physicians pretty much want these different kinds of panels set up so they can uh, look for the syndromes that they're looking for. Right. Great, thank you. 
Um, and then I have a couple more examples from the same uh, from the same product. So here's you know colorectal. There's two colorectal cancer panels. One has 22 genes, and so for that we would name it specifically for colorectal cancer, and then have the multi gene analysis. But then there's a second panel for high risk colorectal cancer, um, where they're actually only looking for seven genes. Um, but you know I, the proposal is that we would still have the same link. Um, for that as well, um, and not call it high risk colorectal cancer, or, you know, throw something else in the component. Um, let me go to the screening. Any comments or questions or raised hands at this point, Jimmy? We do have a comment in the chat um, from Tiffany. Yeah, I was on mute. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> Uh, she says, do we know where entities such as insurance companies sit on these LOINC codes? My understanding is that LOINC is being used for billing and insurance approval purposes. What impact would these conventions have on that? And what conventions would be acceptable to those entities? So that's then, a really interesting question. So as far as I know, LOINC is not used for billing. Um, CPT is used for billing. And so we actually looked at CPT and they have a couple of different codes. And I think, Jimmy, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically one is for less than five genes studied and one is for mm -hmm. five or more genes studied. Yeah, um, and the, uh, several of them are uh, condition specific as well, like, yeah, the cardiomyopathies and things like that. So, but within each of those, they don't have, in terms of expanded versus um, the single gene studies or whatever, the expanded would be that, the five or more. Um, so they weren't really helpful in terms of uh, different levels of expanded um, and how they might have named those. So, but I guess if somebody does know of like being used for billing, please let us know because we were not aware of that. Yeah, and um, also Natera, we did talk with them about what CPT codes they're using, just to kind of see if there was anything we could pull from that. You know, as far as the naming or description um, of right. what we would have in Link and. And again, they're using the same codes, you know, for all, all those tests, really. The same CPTs. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think, Dan, do you have your hand up? I do. Yeah, I like, I like where you're going with this. I wanted to ask you know, two quick clarifying. So uh -huh. just, so the multi-gene is basically, we're going to put that in anytime it's above three, right? That's yes. That's the shorthand. Okay. And then if there were um, multiple conditions, then we would use our same conventions, which would be like uh, what, like an ampersand or whatever in between them. Right, um, and we haven't really come across that. Well, I mean, I guess this first example, it has four conditions, but it's cystic fibrosis, fragile X, SMA, and DMD. So yeah, I suppose if there were only two or three, then we would put those with ampersands, but there's, I actually have an example down here. Sorry about the scrolling. So there's two panels for um, one has CF, SMA, and Fragile X. The other one doesn't have the Fragile X. But those, I mean, if it was a one-to-one -one between the gene and the condition, would actually name it based on the gene, not the condition. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So if, if there were multiple conditions, we would carry the same patterns. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm still mulling over the uh, the extended bit, but that for now, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> And maybe let me just run through this carrier screening one real quick, just because I think it's interesting how so many of them would map to the same one code. And so basically we have the Natera, you know, the four condition, 14, 27, and 106. And then this one specifically, you know, says Ashkenazi and Sephardic ancestry. Um, and so, you know, I have sort of the proposed component, but then the alternate in terms of you know, should we have the population in there as well? Um, but so all four of those would essentially have the same LOINC code. And then, you know, you have this other one that puts on the label of extended. And so potentially that would, would have a different LOINC code. Um, but then all of these Eurofins ones that we looked at with, you know, with and without the SMA and Fragile X, those would have the same LOINC code. If we decided to put on the panethnic label, then, um, you know, then still all four of their tests would have the same link code. Maybe they wouldn't overlap so much with the other labs. Um, but then again, you know, integrated genetics, uh, there are 500 plus genes, 110 conditions and 40 conditions. 
and 13 disorders would all have the same um, the same LOIC code. And then again, you know, for the ones that are three or less, we would just name it according to the genes. Um, but I think, you know, so Dan, like the extended expanded is definitely one of the questions, but then the population is the other big question. I think, you know, if everyone agrees that we're not going to include the number of genes uh, in the component, which it sounds like, you know, people are agreeing with that, then our two remaining questions are related to that. Um, Andrea? Yeah, I was just going to say too, just on the, like the urofins, it looks at the end that there's some that have females only. So if you're um, proposing, you know, like the population based in purple, um, would you still retain the mm. female only part of the population or just leave it as the total population that you're just describing? That's a good question. Um, I think we would leave it as a, just the total population because like we don't have any codes in line that specifically say female or male or child or, well, I mean, there are very few, but you know, those, uh, those are the exceptions and EGF, we try not to do that. EGFRs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so you know, that's the, like, cause you have the male, female, or you have the African, not African population, depending on their reference ranges and stuff. And I know that's changing too, right. but the other question is on the insurance. And I don't know if Tiffany wants to jump into with more on their experience, but um, I know that insurance carriers have required labs as part of their contracts with, to be a approved lab to provide link codes for results. I don't know if they're also requiring them for the orders piece to your point in question. And I don't know too, because I didn't attend the Optum United Healthcare presentation. I think that was probably results focused because I've heard yep. them talk before HL7, but um, I don't know if others have experienced if there's requirements and orders. There was also a comment from Gregory Maletsky about this, this is more on the clinical side, but the ECQMs, in particular, the QPP MIPS rely on link codes. I think that's also though on the results side. And the only comment I had about the females only on the on the pan ethnic is that seems to me to be more of a um, a hint on the ordering for uh, the people looking at the test catalog. Yeah, well, and I think it's because it includes mm -hmm. Fragile X. Mm -hmm. um, this is Leanne, just to go back to the point before about uh, being asked about LOINCs, we are seeing more and more questions um, from carriers requesting LOINCs, yes, at the result level, we've not been pushed for order LOINCs yet, which I don't know that that, again, I don't know that that would ever hold, take foot in the industry to be able to have one loint to order right. any of this testing. So I guess, what do people think about, you know, or I guess, does anyone, um, does anyone know if, you know, extended and expanded have sort of, you know, well-defined or well-accepted meanings in the genetic space? And if we should, include them and it's possible that if you know if we say extended that it, the definition could sort of evolve and so if today extended for um you know for carrier screening means 274 or 300 conditions maybe next year if there's a thousand conditions then in the industry the definition of extended might change and so the same link code could be used but uh, personally, I think that's also confusing because then if somebody has a result for extended multi-gene analysis that was done two years ago, you have no idea which, you know, was it really the extended one or not? Um, but anyway, that, so that's a question. And then in terms of the populations, I don't know what people's feelings are about whether those should be included. And I'm also unclear on what pan-ethnic means. Um, and I was, you know, I looked on various lab sites and couldn't really find any information. I thought I had a question about that up here somewhere, but um, basically, does it mean, does it mean, you know, every ethnicity, so essentially the same as the not specified, or are they looking at certain ethnicities, um, and it just doesn't say on their website, maybe it's known in the genetic space. I wonder, Swapna, um, uh -huh. 
by specifying pan-ethnic or ethnic or the specific ethnicity, if that signals though the test, the focus of the test, you know, what's gonna be done. Um, pan-ethnic meaning they're looking at, you know, inherited conditions and in certain across ethnicities, um, the ones that are most, you know, relevant or whatever it might be um, versus if they're doing just an Ashkenaz Jewish panel, um, they're going to be looking at very specific conditions um, that are relevant for them. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe that would be important to include in the order code name in the link. We do like have... pan-ethnic signals it's across versus a specific ethnic screening. I'm sorry, I didn't see the order of hands that were raised, but we have oh. Jenna Riker, Dan Bremen, and Stan Huff willing to Great. pitch in here. Uh, Jenna? Yeah, um, I'm just looking at one of our uh, tests for the Ashkenazi Jewish diseases and trying to see, you know, if we use this method, where would I stick low ink codes? Uh -huh. We would still have lots missing. So we, you know, we would have uh, components that wouldn't, would still not have a low ink code because we're saying what gene and what allele is involved. So the, the codes that we're talking about here would fit on the component that we would call the panel results. So that makes sense. But if it, it, the word extended would not mean anything really in that context. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, from a from a user trying to assign the low ink right. perspective, where what how would I handle this? And basically, you're we're talking about I can put a code on one of in this particular panel one of ten components, and the rest are still empty. So just for discussion, that might be helpful, um, Jenna to. Uh, take as a sidebar because I believe that we may have the the other link codes for those 10 totally, components. Yeah, totally possible. Um, uh -huh. we, we are missing quite a few in that regard. So okay. yeah. Yeah, we'll see if we can figure out a pattern for ARUP. Yeah, and just to reiterate for the ones that are only looking at, you know, one or two or three genes or just a very specific variant, we would still create the more specific code and it wouldn't be general like this. Um, but yeah, but we would have to look at, um, maybe if you could send us some examples, then we could look at those. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out from, from the perspective like of a chart, if you have a 274 gene panel, how is that chart organized? And does that kind of give us any indication of how the low inks could be assigned? And I guess just to also clarify, these would be the order codes, not the result ah, codes. Yeah, sorry, I missed that part. Yes, yeah, perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, definitely. These would be these would be the order codes, and then that the clarifies results. things. Yes, <laughs> yes. So may I ask uh, something? Mm -hmm. I this is Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Hi. So if I well understood, are you thinking to include in the multi-gene definition? NHS plus MLPA studies, but sometimes um, uh, MLPA studies are broader concerning the DNA target. Uh, so what do you think about it? Maybe associated observation can specify the target DNA and the type of variant detected? Exactly. And so, you know, for all of these, obviously, this code is so generic, it's not going to tell you anything about the results. And so we would recommend using the, um, the model developed by clinical genomics with the, um, with the discrete uh, light codes for reporting, you know, the genes, the variant found, the method, you know, all of those details would be reported using the specific light codes for those uh, pieces of information. Okay, thank you. But my, my question was related to the difference between the target DNA. You know, sometimes the MLAPA uh, are broader, detects more regions than the NHS genes. So uh, how do you manage this uh, different kind of testing in the same, in the same order? Oh, I see. Um, I, I guess I would have to look at it. I'm not really sure. Um, Jamie, do you know? Yeah, I, I think we would have to look at the details to see if it would just fit within because like our existing codes just say by molecular genetics method and a lot of multi-gene studies quite a few of them do next generation sequencing as well as deletion duplication analysis by various methods like MLPA so MLPA is just one of them there's many other ways to look for large deletion duplications but that's often a key part of these um, studies 
And so, and then a lot of labs will uh, have, you know, next generation sequencing as their primary method and, and then later add, you know, a deletion duplication as part of the study that maybe previously they didn't have. Um, but these, these tests, another thing about them is they do change over time. Sometimes the targets change, yeah. you know, the genes change. Um, so um, by specifying or being too specific in the order, it, it you know, it, then that leads to having to remap later whenever new versions come out. Yeah. So it's, um, I think that's why we're trying to go down this route of trying yeah, to because we, we, we commonly have this uh, problem with orders with our clients because maybe they, they are using uh, uh, a panel, uh, NHS panel, and uh, they add two different products of MLPA to cover all the NHS um, uh, target uh, target genes. So sometimes for us it's very difficult to identify uh, the order uh, for this kind of test. So that mix uh, NHS plus uh, two, maybe three uh, different M MLPA products. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, get uh, Dan Bremen some time at the mic and then Stan. Thanks. Um, I was going to just express my, uh, I guess, hesitation or worry about adding extended. It seems to me um, that its its meaning is really only um, based in time and relative to the performing lab, right? right. Like, mm -hmm. um, and that as a label um, and a distinguisher for concepts over time feels not good. Um, and I feel like there's enough um, as we're going down the road of, of um, you know, labeling by condition, there's already, you know, inherent variability over time in what might be represented there. So I feel like adding this isn't really going to help anybody, and it'll probably just cause more confusion um, down the road. So I think we should probably stay away from it unless we have new information about some, uh, you know, more stable definition uh, of, of what that would be. I was trying to think of other analogies and um, you know, like in radiology, you'll, you'll sometimes have, I think we distinguish some like limited studies, but there it's kind of a stable meaning. It's, it's you know, focused on this one thing and where it, what it means is we're not gonna be commenting on, you know, this broader range of things. And so, so it makes sense, uh, but here I feel like it, it, it's too, um, too squishy. Yeah, agreed. Dan, Dan, what are your thoughts on the um, specifying the ethnicity or uh, um, the pan-ethnic? Well, let concepts. me think about it. Stand, okay. Stand talk and then, uh, <laughs> okay. And then I'll Sounds come back, good. <laughs> yeah, I was, <clears throat> I was just thinking about the order codes and and just another uh, kind of particular use case that might come into play. I don't, I don't know. Those of you who are experts could say. But are these tests things that might come uh, at some point and need prior authorization? Uh, and if so, then you you know you want names, basically that uh, that would tell the insurance company what you're intending to order and uh, what the what the conditions are that justify that. And and so I think we we just want to consider. Uh, that the names might be used for prior authorization kind of situations uh, and and include things that would make it clear to payers and and, and insurers, you know, what it is we, we're wanting authorization for. So that's interesting. So Stan, do you think p clinicians are using the LOIC code names for prior authorization and not the actual uh, lab test names? Uh, well, I think you would, I would rather have them use link codes because the logic around them would be the same. Uh, if you do, yeah, if, if you do the each laboratory, then, I mean, the insurance companies are dealing with lots of different laboratories. So you're just gonna complicate their, their lives by giving basically the same tests, different names based on the lab. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, my only concern then is, you know, I mean, prior off for a 500 gene test. Yeah. I just don't know what they're looking at in terms of, you know, if somebody's getting a 40 condition versus 500 genes and presumably, you know, that many conditions or maybe 
slightly fewer. But anyway, if they were all using the same light code, then yeah, I mean, I mean, some of these names I don't think would be um, things that you would use in a description for prior authorization, but others I think where especially the condition ones, right? Uh, the the conditions ones could could well be used for prior authorization to say we want to do a you know, we want to do a cardiac uh, genetic screening. Yeah, that makes sense. We have David Bayorto and then Rob McClure's hands are raised. I, oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just going to respond to Dan Vreeman's comment about extended um, in the name. And I, I definitely second, second that because, you know, it sort of has the same kind of flavor to me as as a code that says other, I mean, it's dependent on other terms in the vocabulary to understand the meaning at the time. Um, and that just makes it really ambiguous. So I would think about, and I don't know if this fits yet, but since this is an area that's evolving quickly and there could be changes in these panels, and I would think about using the, you know, using a distinction for this panel is evolving. This, you know, even using the word maybe evolving panel, you know, somehow to indicate that that there, there's a fixed panel that's already set in stone, and then this here's a panel that kind of tests for the same kind of stuff, but this one is the evolutionary panel that we can use for as things move along. I don't know. I don't know if that kind of thing uh, is feasible, but that's kind of my first thought when I see this. Yeah, that's interesting, and that kind of you know it makes me wonder. Like, I don't think anything's set in stone <laughs> personally in this space. So I wonder if, you know, if this, you know, maybe next year this 274 one would be set in stone or, you know, the set in stone version, and then there'd be some other one. But yeah, I mean, maybe, so maybe the, the LOIC codes wouldn't be pinned necessarily to the existing definitions, but, you know, I like, I guess I'm not quite sure how to capture it in the LOIC code in terms of evolving or, you know, whatever word we use, but anyway, but I like that idea of saying it's more, though maybe that's what extended is meant to capture. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Rob, did you have any comment? I saw your hand well, went down. Yeah, yeah, so can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so two things. First, um, you know, if we're talking about prior auth, you know, it's not, that Stan noted, and I'm, I'm sure you guys aren't surprised to know that there's a Da Vinci fire specification around prior authorization. And, um, and in fact, I think it's probably, I don't know if this one's in regs, but, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. And it does expect you to send a code that says, this is what I'm asking for prior authorization of. So, so there's that. So you, I, you know, we're not going to be sending string names of things like people were faxing stuff before. But the, um, you know, and I this aligns a little bit with what I was thinking about for one part of the gender harmony thing, and that is, do we have anything where we can say that it is a kind of screen, carrier screening test? So in us, in essence. You might just say that, and then, um, and then there's a way that we could just let any, maybe it's a string that says Natura Horizon for condition, right? I, I'm just not sure that, in other words, is there a way that we can do this where we don't have to enumerate all the possible combinations? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. It's going to be specific probably to locale and things like that. You know, it's gonna constantly change as new organizations put them together. And in fact, it's more similar to the sort of things like I'm, I'm dealing with um, drug screening. And um, while I don't have the kind of knowledge about what's actually happening on the ground, my sense is, is that each organization actually decides what set of drugs with some obvious all you know consistency go into their particular screening 
And so they obviously map to a LOINC, but we've got a few LOINCs, but, uh, and, but you know, to think that we would have every possible combination of drug screening tests that's going to show up in every place where you're going to run them, um, I think we've already figured out that's not true. So I think we need to find out a similar way here where we just allow the, the community to communicate in ways that probably are not computable with regards to the specific, but any single institution isn't going to be dealing with, you know, hundreds, they're going to be dealing with four or five, and they're just going to recognize them, right? So is there a way that we can do that? So, you know, we've been thinking about that, and we have a way to attach associated observations to particular codes. Um, and those are basically, um, well, how best to explain. So basically, like, if you had the code for carrier screen multi-gene analysis, we could attach an associated observation for the reference lab test name that would let you send the specific, you know, name of exactly what was being ordered. Um, we actually have the, the clinical genomics, like the discrete um, variable genetics panels attached to all of our genetics document codes so that you can actually use all of those discrete links to send the results. Um, but this would be the same thing, you know, I mean, I think the order would be for, you know, or the like code would be this, carrier screening multi-gene right. analysis, but then you would have another code that says, oh, and by the way, you know, it's, I'm actually ordering the Natera Horizon carrier screening test with 27 conditions. What, so could, let me just say this so that I can come back later uh -huh. and find out exactly, but this is very similar to the way that I was thinking for the gender harmony, the uh, recorded sex and gender, so that you would basically identify, because I was saying that could be a grouper, but it really what I would like to say is that it's like this, it's a, it is a thing that just kind of tags the next thing I'm going to send you as a one of these, right? So it sounds like that's what you're saying here is that this would be, this is saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I want a carrier screen multigene analysis, but just that alone, I mean, it doesn't give you the specifics. You can put some stuff with it and then right. it would just be known as that. But, but if you have something specific, there is a, a link way of saying, and this is the thing I, I meant that was that. And if that is what we could do here, that's very much what we could do for recorded sex and gender. And, and I can imagine a lot of things in the genomics world you know, because there's a bunch of these things are there. They they create right the string that's used to describe it by taking pieces that come from these various different um, things that are being tested or the results. And so I think that's a that's something we shouldn't step in front of. We want them to continue to be able to do that, and we just need slots to stick that stuff that's identified. Yeah, and I mean, it would just be like using any, you know, a LOINC code. I mean, just because it's attached or not attached as an associate observation doesn't mean that somebody wouldn't be able to use that same method. I just, I guess I'm not entirely clear on if people are using the associate observations or how those are being implemented. Um, but, you know, but it's, but we have a LOINC code that says what is the specific test that was done. And so I think, you know, I think people being able to use that, I mean, this to me is also similar to like, allergy testing, you know, like when I was practicing, I still remember there was like this huge form and then you basically checked off which allergens, you know, but you're still just ordering allergy testing and you're not going to have a separate order code for every single combination of allergens. So you have to have a way to say, I'm ordering allergy testing on this patient and the specific allergens I would like tested are blah, blah, blah. You know, like to, I feel like that's similar. Um, and even in like the infectious diseases space, like, you know, with the multiplex testing, all the, you know, different test kits have different numbers of um, organisms and, you know, things that are they're testing for. And so we've actually started creating more generic codes that say respiratory pathogens or, you know, GI pathogens or whatever, without actually sort of saying exactly what is in that particular test kit. But, you know, at the same time, you still need to know which test kit was being used, so that information would go elsewhere. Leanna Harmon also had her hand raised. Um, I just wanted to echo a little bit of what I've been hearing, but um, 
especially with the tox world, this world is basically the same way. You would rabbit hole and never be able to touch everything. And just, I guess, just a little insight for the future is I can see this very easily being very customizable for a physician. Um, in other words, he's got that big form in front of him or he knows about certain genes. And so from a carrier screening perspective, he may only want to see 10 or the next time he may want to do the 500 plus. So this is this world is just exploding. And I think, you know, the more generic you can be, the better off you're going to be. But I also understand on the other side that people want more specificity, but I don't think you're ever going to fit it into a box. I'll put it that way. It's just too, it's growing too much. Yeah, agreed. John Snyder, did you have uh, a comment? Uh, just two quick questions, actually. The, the first is around the uh, extended or evolving use in the name. If all of the panel children use an ROC flag of either optional or blank, does that essentially imply that it's an evolving panel so it negates the need for identifying that in the name? So, John, so these won't actually be panel codes. They're going to be, okay. um, yeah, they're going to be document codes. And so, okay. yeah, because there's no way we could you know, keep up with having 500 genes, you know, I, okay. yeah, it, it, it's actually, it's a document code. So I, I apologize. I saw yeah. the extended panel in the name and I got a little, confused Oh yeah. There. Yeah. Sorry. So, that's the product. Uh -huh. That's okay. Yeah. The second question I had was um, with the female only um, codes right below where Pam has her cursor right now. Um, with Rob's presentation on the Gender Harmony Project, uh, is there any concern with having that uh, with the in conjunction with the complex uh, sex for clinical use, uh, and that creating any issues at the implementation level? Um, so, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the Gender Harmony presentation um, at an yeah. emergency dentist appointment. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, but this is actually so. This is the lab. Uh, this is a lab name. And so we're actually proposing not having that information, like these two columns, sorry, and I realize you can't see the whole thing, but these two columns would be what the blank component potentially would be. Right. Um, well, I think the what, horizon what he's, he's kind of referring to is, is that um, the, so one of the things that um, you guys probably know better than I is that lab tests when ordered, they would have, um, information obviously about the patient. And I, I guess it's standard that there would be a, uh, a code, well, traditionally, if it's sent via, for example, uh, a V2 message, probably from what I'm being told, they just look at PID-8, which is the administrative sex um, field. And the assumption is that all of the tests in that order set can align with the assumption that that tells them all they need to know about the physiologic sex of the patient. So, correct. What we are, what we talked about yesterday, although we didn't get into the details, is is that we would. In fact, I just wrote a little blurb about a response yesterday about this, and and the answer would be you should not be using PID-8 to do that. Um, and so what how that actually gets worked out, I don't know. Or everybody just agrees that what they put in PID-8 is what we were calling sex for clinical use yesterday. In other words, the, the clinical use targeted representation of phenotypic sex for this patient with regards to the set of exams in this order could go in PID-8 if everybody agrees or goes in a sex for clinical use uh, observation that would go along with this. So, and, and then you could test for that, right? You could still send carrier screening, uh, a multi-gene analysis. You could do an associated observation that has got that string in it that says females only. And then we would like for you to send an OBX that's got a new code for sex for clinical use that would have F to confirm that you're actually doing the right thing. That's the way I would put all that together. Awesome, thank you. Dan Freeman has more. <laughs> I guess I'm coming back to the 
pan-ethnic yep. uh, question. I've been thinking about this a little bit and kind of building on what Rob said and agreeing wholeheartedly with what Leanne said earlier. I feel like this is a, it's not as much, it's more, you know, it's a characteristic of the patient for whom the test is being ordered more so than an indication of the expected information content coming back, unless there was another way to sort of clarify what the difference between those are. I feel a little bit, I guess I feel a little bit uncomfortable with that as the, the way in which we distinguish the difference between the tests is kind of who it's intended for. Um, recognizing there are you know, a lot of complexities around sort of establishing ethnicity and so forth anyway, labeling it and so forth. Um, it feels like it would probably at least at, specifically at this time would be probably not a distinguishing characteristic I'd recommend making maybe as we learn more and we get you know additional experience um, perhaps but I think also something along the lines of establishing conventions for you know better communication of that information in the exchange would be a better way to go than um, than probably making different link codes for those orders so that's kind of my sort of summary impression mulling it over a little bit and hearing what everyone else had to say Thanks. Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, we were just talking about female only. And to me, it's very similar to that, right? And if, if we're not going to put that in the, yep. in the test name, then why would we put pan ethnic or, you know, the specific in the cities? Um, okay, so let me actually, I'm just going to type a few notes to try to summarize, um, <laughs> summarize the conversation here. So it seems like uh, people are, oops, sorry. Condition specific like components. Um, and then in general, you know, don't include when you mention like components, do you mean the orders? Oh, sorry, just the component part of the like code. Of the order, yeah. Of the okay. Link. Yeah. The, re sorry. the reason I'm asking is because lab results are components with certain vendors. Oh, so yeah. Sorry. I just want to make sure that there's no confusion on that. So thank you. With, uh, yeah. So I can say link component or the. Um, and. That about covers it. Um, Jamie, did I miss anything? Uh, just not really. I, the only other agreement seems that we won't be including numbers. In oh, them. yeah. I yes, mean, but or thing. ranges of yeah. genes, counts of genes being tested. But I think I think everybody's in agreement with that. Yeah. All right. Well, are there any other comments or does anybody else want well, to say anything? I do have one. So we have that large scale term. Oh, right. And I wonder, because it's cancer related, large scale. And I'm wondering if we need to update that existing code. Um, because I think that fits with these multi gene studies. Yeah. Unless absolutely. there was something relevant with the targeted aspect of it. Um, meaning it's not. Yeah. Yeah, and we yeah we should look at that. The other thing that we didn't actually bring up just because this was complicated enough is this. So I don't know why I'm bringing it up now, but anyway, when we're looking at the Eurofins, they actually have this exact set of uh, tests, but that are targeted. And so these four are done by full gene sequencing. But if you look at their website right below that, they have the exact same you know carrier screen with SMA with Fragile X and with both uh, that's targeted. And so there is definitely another layer of complexity that Jamie and I were gonna start looking into about whether, you know, whether it can just be carrier screen multi-gene analysis or if it has to be carrier screening, um, full multi-gene analysis or targeted multi-gene analysis. Um, so there is one more layer, but yeah, I think we need to 
Jamie, we need to sort that out mm -hmm. and then figure out what to do with the existing code. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so, yeah, that was a really great discussion. Jamie and I were a little bit uh, worried about how this is going to go just because it's so complicated. But uh, thank you, everybody, for all of your input. You got us early, so, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a good way to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Okay, so we'll move on to the second item on the agenda, which was example units in LOINC for allergen-specific IgE studies. Yes. Okay, just one second here. Close that one out. Sorry, I should have had this ready. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, this discussion is around the question of should the current um, uh, units that are attached to these quantitative allergen specific IgE terms be replaced with um, the a UA unit, meaning unit of allergen. Um, and a new UCOM unit being requested or submitted, because um, this unit currently does not exist in LOINC and or in uh, UCOM, sorry, or in LOINC. Um, so just a little bit of background, we currently have over a thousand allergen specific IgE codes, arbitrary concentration codes um, that have the example international units. Only the total IgE is calibrated to the official WHO standard, World Health Organization standard for total IgE. Uh, the calibration curve uh, used for most, if not all, total IgE assays is based on this WHO um, standard. The specific IgE antibodies um, are expressed in that unit of allergen where A represents allergen-specific antibodies. Um, the allergen specific IgE was created in, uh, to distinguish it from the total IgE international unit. Um, and so I think the concern is, is that we have international unit assigned to all of these existing codes, but we're really thinking that was incorrect. And I think what may have happened too over time is that uh, we had units of the kilo, kilo uh, U, the big U, capital U, per liter for a lot of these allergen codes, but because U um, represents enzymatic unit in UCOM, we wanted to avoid that confusion. Um, and so we clarified, and they probably should have, if there was any update, it probably should have been changed to an arbitrary unit versus an international unit. So, but in any case, we have uh, you know many terms. And so we wanted to bring this to the committee before we updated everything. Um, in LOINC, since this will affect a lot of terms. Um, a lot of labs, uh, not all, but a lot of labs report in that, uh, using that U per liter, capital U per liter. Um, but again, that's kind of not recommended through UCOM because of the confusion that it can cause with the enzymatic unit. Um, UCOM does have allergen units, the AU and the BAU, uh, which refer to the potency of the allergen the standardized allergen extracts. It's not referring to the in vitro allergen specific IgE determinations. And this text here is just pulled from UCOM. Um, so just to clarify that, that there's a little bit of confusion because there's this AU um, for the potency, but then also the UA re you know, refers to the other, the allergen unit. Um, now, we talked with Thermal Fisher and Dr. Goldberg, Bruce Goldberg, he's our allergen specialist, and he wasn't able to attend the call today, but he definitely helped prep um, some of this discussion. Um, and so in talking with them, they do recommend adding the specific IgE units um, as that unit of allergen uh, to UCOM. And they state that the um, international unit, although down here, technically they are, several studies have shown that they are kind of a one-to-one, -one, um, they do recommend to avoid confusion using that UA uh, unit instead. And they think it would be appropriate to request that addition to UCOM. 
Um, and then just some other side comments, really. The uh, Thermo Fisher does have a multiplex allergen assay where they report the units are reported in ISU, so a little different, but another arbitrary unit. Um, and then I might have skipped over it. Uh, but in LOINC, currently, we do have a lot of codes um, where we use arbitrary unit to express, you know, and which can indicate whether it's the U per liter or the um, AU per liter, um, or not AU, but UA, sorry, UA per liter and so on. So um, we do have this unit currently in LOINC um, associated with a lot of other allergen terms. Arbit arbitrary concentration terms. Um, and then we have a couple of references here that we can look at if needed. But overall, our proposals are to request that the U, and then we're suggesting lowercase a to kind of help distinguish, at least in my mind, to distinguish between the AU, the potency units, um, to use that lowercase a, and then also kind of hint that it's technically a subscript. Um, and that was somewhere here. But anyway, it's technically a subscript. So uh, be added to the new as a new unit um, of measure in UCOM. And then once that happens, then we can update all the existing allergen specific IGE terms um, to have that uh, UA um, with the example units. I think this would be a leader more, more likely. But anyway, we could uh, look at that representative, whether it's a the volume is milliliter or liter. Um, other, alternatively, we can uh, use the arbitrary units, which would represent you know, various kinds of allergen specific units that are assigned. Okay, I will stop there and I don't know if we have any questions or thoughts. So, so I have one comment that um, I don't think is going to play in here, but the I would say that the number one reason to add a UCOM unit is if there's a conversion that you need to represent, right? So, um, and so I, I just want to confirm that I think you're saying there isn't a conversion that needs to be associated with this new unit, correct? I'm not aware of one. I think overall studies have said that it's a one-to-one -to, -one to the international unit, that world, the WHO standard. Um, well, if you... But I, I wasn't, yeah, I didn't realize that, that, that yeah. Well, so, but, you, yeah, so I, 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 that's what, I guess we need to be sure about that. Because, again, I think that the big... The big value of UCOM, granted, I don't know how many people use it, particularly in the United States, where we tend to just, you know, kind of not, well, I, you know, in the scientific community, I think it makes a big difference. In this particular situation, I don't, I don't know that it does. But if there was a need to represent the fact that there is a conversion that occurs, and so maybe that you know, I mean, you keep saying, I don't know if these things are equal, <laughs> so we couldn't put it in. But if we knew they were equal and they are used in different places, then I think that for me is, um, you know, puts it over the top and says, yeah, we, we should do it in UCOM because that's, you know, one of the great values of UCOM is that it provides a way of translating between units. If it's just yet another unit, um, then I think it's, I don't know what, you know, Regan Streif has used in the past to decide, uh, you know, other than, you know, kind of force of the community and saying, well, we use this unit all the time in this environment and, you know, let's make it official. And I'd say, okay, <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's it's true. Been, it's been my understanding all in the lab world that if their units of measure are IU per anything, it is indicating that there was an international standard that the assay is based on. And so where we got slipped up is that in the, while the total IGE can be measured against an international standard, there are none truly for 
the shrimp antibody or the birch mm -hmm. antibody. And so we're trying to make a correction, uh, an obvious correction that it's more of a, an arbitrary uh, unit and it's a, it's a subgrouping. Um, so I, I, I personally kind of like the idea of just using the existing unit because there is no conversion um, that I'm aware of. And maybe some of the pathologists in the room would, uh, or allergen uh, experts can bring that up. But I think we're just trying to fix the implication of how the unit is reading. Yeah, exactly. I think just to add to that, I think, you know, one of the most important things is that currently we have an example you can unit in the link table for all these that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's less about should we add a new unit you know, to Yukum versus, you know, we need to fix that. And so what should we use basically? Oh, I, okay. I didn't quite catch that. I think that's, so you, uh, yeah. So the question is, do we put in an arbitrary to, to fix the one that needs to come out or do we exactly. make something specific since there was something specific before? Okay. Yep. <laughs> don't know uh dan you want to go ahead sure yeah I, I like your proposal i think you know we have cover these are uh example units so we're not saying <laughs> that you know <laughs> we're we don't have to worry as much i think it's a good correction we should we should do it and i would say um, you know, the conversation of whether it should be uh, added to, to UCOM or not, um, you know, or the equivalent would be added, you know, we could let Bruce and <laughs> or Thermo Fisher or whoever wanted to, you know, make that case, uh, you know, bring that through the UCOM process. And uh, if so, we could, you know, take it back on, on the lung side here and see if, if we needed to do anything. But um, but I, I like your proposal. I think it makes uh, it makes sense and is a good uh, correction. I don't know. Um, I guess probably just in the release notes as far as um, how we would communicate uh, this this kind of a change. This is just sort of a, a comment in the, in the release notes. Or is there any other way we signal updates to units? I don't believe so. We can put them in a public change reason field um, for all of the terms that get updated. Oh, um, right. So we do have a way to put it directly with the link code, but we would, you know, I I, sometimes we've just done it in the release notes and noted it there um, rather than, yeah, you know, making, because the other thing is um, that field, the unit field is tracked with history. Um, so, and we've been looking at ways to show history for specific fields over time to the mm -hmm. users mm -hmm. versus just a general public change reason. So Dan, were you saying the alternative or the the which one are you kind of leaning towards or the first proposal or the alternative proposal? Um, I kind of liked the first proposal, mm -hmm. except that the whole like request to to yeah. them. Um, I don't know. It's our job. <laughs> yeah. And see, I'm hesitant to update everything to arbitrary units unless that's what we're going to do and keep it at that. Um, because then if we're going to then update them all again, if later it's decided oh. that this is a valid UCOM unit, oh. then we would need to go back to all those terms and hmm. change their units. And I mean, it can be done. It's just, you know, it's an update to over a thousand terms. So twice. <laughs> yeah. And sort of doubly confusing to the user community. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why I like the alternate proposal is because uh, when a unit of measure is sitting on the line of display with the assay to the left of it, that's the, aller the um, analyte is already been provided by the display of the test. So to have unit of allergen is just like to say, this is milligrams of creatinine per deciliter. Does that make sense? You're, you're kind of repeating information that's already accompanying the unit of measure, which is the analyte name. 
That actually convinces me of the alternate proposal because I think she's right. You know, I think Pam's right that the information that you need is already there and this is superfluous in many respects. So Jamie, there's one question. Um, mm -hmm. what, is, what is the definition of UA? I may have missed that. If you could scroll back up just to show what Exactly, that means it's a unit of allergen specific antibodies. Um, and then here it says, uh, Yeah, I think it's right up, it's the first sub bullet, the Kilo International. Oh, yeah, right yep. here. Mm -hmm. There's another comment from Jenna that she prefers the alternative proposal. So thank you. The other thing about the alternative is it's more representative. Like for instance, this um, multiplex assay, they report in ISU units um, for the same arbitrary. So they would be using the same existing arbitrary concentration terms for allergy specific um, for the allergen specific results within this assay, but the results will be reported in that case in ISU. Um, otherwise, Thermal Fisher typically reports um, in the UA, you know, the unit of allergen for the, uh, their other assays. Uh, and then a lot of labs, as we mentioned earlier, just use that, the U. Um, so they, having an arbitrary unit kind of encompasses all those different ways um, of reporting a arbitrary yeah. unit. Jamie, I'd also add that under the UCOM standard, you can add an additional annotation comment using the curly brackets. So if a lab decides that they need to further specify the arbitrary units and the alternative proposal, they do have that option with and still stay within the UCOM standard. Okay, so I'm hearing um, the decision is to use the alternative proposal. And then I don't know if there was um, suggestion maybe to let Thermo Fisher know that if they would like to submit a request, they could do that. And or that if would we be just... a request for the U for UCOM? For Not the U one. yeah, to UCOM, sorry. Okay, thank you. To UCOM. Maybe we could also, in that same email, let them have information that John was just describing. Mm, the curly Q brackets. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jamie, do you think it would make sense to let Thermo Fisher know what we decided, but before we make updates, if, like if they're, they feel strongly that they do want to request a new UCOM unit, then you know, then maybe we would use the UCOM unit because otherwise it's going to be silly if we, you know, if we sort of update and then we send them in the email and then they're like, oh yeah, we'll request a new unit. And then, you know, and then they okay. do that. And then we update again. Okay. Yeah. Rework's a four letter word. That makes sense. <laughs> Give a little counter offer, see what they go with. Right. <laughs> And Jamie, if they do decide to submit for a new UCOM unit and that gets approved, uh, we will want to make sure that they also request it to be updated in the HL7 value set that's being used to validate the units of measure, um, because that'll need to be kept in sync. Yeah, and I think, wasn't it you, John? Someone was proposing four new ones, right? So we... Yeah, that was John Demore. Uh, we oh, did okay, some of that right. work while I was at Diameter. Yeah, right. So, so we definitely do need to update that. I've gotten a few comments that there's some common units that no surprise that there are units out there that are being used that aren't in that list. Mm -hmm. But because of how difficult UCOM is, um, we need to keep that list populated let's just put it that way <laughs> agree I, I, I think we should not 
try and restrict it and say only the com only the common ones should be in here. I think we need to put all the ones that get used in there. And certainly, uh, speaking of that particular list, all of the ones that are listed in LOINC tables as example units should be in that list. And guess what? They're not. But that's a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> we need to write that in the margin someplace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was notified of that one time. I was like, okay, that's interesting. Okay. Well, this was helpful. Thank you. All right, so next up is the order code for single primary result with secondary results. And Jamie or David, um, whoever's going to present, why don't you go ahead? Hi, Pam. Sure. Um, so I will tee that one up. Uh, let me just get myself set for a second. Okay, so this topic, um, well, earlier in the meeting, Swabna and Jamie presented a complicated, thorny um, topic that turned out to be pretty straightforward in, in the discussion. So I'm a little worried about this one because initially it seemed, well, this is a pretty straightforward uh, topic. So we'll see where it goes. Um, so what we're discussing here is order code, what to use for an order code when there's really just a single primaries, primary result that may have secondary associated results with it, or it's not really a panel. Um, let's see, I'm not advancing here. For some reason, there we go. So this was, it, it really arose from a submitter who was looking for guidance on whether or not to submit um, for this set of panels. And the panels all have, the panels that they were th thinking of submitting for or asking for guidance on whether they should all have the same kind of structure, really looking for uh, a, a single primary result, some analyte to creatinine ratio, but also included the uh, calcium concentration and creatinine concentration result. Seems like a pretty straightforward thing that we, would have seen before in LOINC. Um, but I think we really don't have a policy on these and we really need one at this point because we have kind of a smattering of different uh, ways that various labs have chosen to model these and map them to LOINC. So moving on, here's a few existing examples from Mayo. Uh, here you can see that the order code that uh, they're using, that Mayo uses for the uh, arsenic to creatinine ratio um, is basically they're using the, the result value for the ars, ars, arsenic over creatinine ratio urine. So these this is an order and observation code, so it's valid to use it as an order code. But even though they report the total concentration, instead of mapping this to a panel code, they map the order to the primary result here. Uh, here's a second. Um, example from Mayo where, you know, they, they actually have a different choice. Uh, there are three components or three children in this panel, uh, magnesium concentration, creatinine concentration, and then finally the primary result, which is the ratio. And here they're actually using the concentration as the, uh, as the order code. So I, th I think we need some guidance here. Here's some examples from LabCorp, uh, calcium to creatinine ratio. They are, as we might've, um, as we might be proposing later using the uh, primary calcium to creatinine ratio result as the order code you can see in this column. But here's another similar example of chromium where they have not yet assigned an order code. Um, so I think the bottom line is that we have, you know, some inconsistency in the choices of the LOINC order code that's that are out there. And, and I think that results from the fact that we really aren't providing guidance uh, for this particular scenario or type of scenario yet. Um, another example is a similar case where 
you know, just to show that this is not just creatinine ratios we're talking about. Here's an example from a SARS-CoV-2 IgG test. Um, this is the Libet file that's on the CDC website where uh, there are two result codes for this IgG test. One is the reported quantitative value units per volume of the IgG antibody. And the second kind of is an interpretation of that, an ordinal interpretation, which is, you know, basically negative or positive. Um, in this case, in the LIVID file, um, our group, our LIVID group decided in this case to use the order code for the quantitative result. And this is fairly typical in like where we use the quantitative result when the result is quantitative followed by uh, an order. But again, we need a policy because even within this LIVID file, uh, there are cases where there may be some inconsistency and maybe a panel code was chosen here instead. So I think we need to establish this kind of policy just so that we, we know what to do moving forward. And it, it's gonna help us as well because you know, in the context of our value set work group, which I'm gonna talk about a little later, we're trying to establish parameters around when to use different uh, groupers or aggregator models in like, and um, this will help us establish a parameter around panels or add to the uh, parameters around panels. Here are some existing LOINC terms uh, for panels where we see this kind of thing. Um, here's a pyridinylene panel, urine, where again, the primary result is R is pyridinylene over creatinine molar ratio. Um, the only other value reported in this case is the creatinine. Um, so, you know, this would be, I think, a case where we could look at existing LOINC panels and consider discouraging the use of them and using the pyridinylene over creatinine ratio as the order code instead of um, instead of a panel code where there's really not multiple pieces of information and it's not really a panel per se. Another example um, is here. Uh, again, it's you know a quantitative value for uh, Zika virus IgM and an interpretation code, and that. Um, again, is assembled as a panel, whereas if we, we saw the example in the LIVID file, we could use just the quantitative code, and this could be an associated observation to that code. A few other examples um, that we wouldn't be as clear on what to do with. Um, you know, Fragile X, we'd have to kind of look at, at these case by case, but here's again, the result is uh, FMRP cells per 100 lymphocytes, and then an interpretation. Here's an example of a biotinidase panel with, um, enzymatic activity and then a normal control. Um, whether these are really panels is, is somewhat questionable and whether what to do with these, these kinds of examples, I'm not sure. These, I think we're a little more clear that we would consider discouraging them. But that's what part of this uh, discussion is to get input from this committee uh, regarding that. So um, here's some existing panel examples, more question marks. I think uh, another example of a microalbumin over creatinine panel where the, where the microalbumin concentration, creatinine concentration are reported separately and, and the mass ratio um, is the third one. And, and in this case, you know, this is why these things are, are questionable is that the two required children in this panel are these two. So in this case, we couldn't get away with just saying that this is the order code. Um, you know, another example. And then there's, of course, all the 24-hour urines, which include, um, you know, mass per time uh, and mass, you know, mass per time um, results, which I think we couldn't get, a, we, we would need to leave these 24-hour ones as panels uh, for that reason. So that one's thumbs up. So, uh, uh, Jamie, do you want to add anything to this uh, or, you know, present the proposal, I, I, you know, like I, I know we kind of looked at this together. So, do you have anything else to say to add? No, uh, and um, yeah, I think you outlined it and providing the examples is really helpful. So, I don't have anything else. Okay. So the proposal is whether or not we we can, you know, we should consider for especially for that submitter's question in those creatinine ratio tests, suggest using the ratio to primary result term as the order code. Um, and consider discouraging existing panels that fit that defined criteria of a single primary child result. Um, we don't actually have that many panels that 
you know, fit that model right now. So I think we wouldn't be discouraging too many terms. But moving forward, we'd want some guidance on whether to create the, these as panels and include the, I guess we would include the ratio, the primary analyte concentration, the creatinine concentration, and the ratio term, or whether we should just use the ratio term as the, um, as the order. And I think that's what the proposal is to do. And then if uh, we would have to address the questionable ones that I pointed out, and then we would update the user's guide um, section on panels to basically with this um, terminology that, um, and thanks uh, Jamie for helping me write this, in cases where uh, the single, a single result is reported along with secondary results that serve as supporter or interpretive findings, the light code assigned to the primary result should be used as the order code. So I think we'll open that for discussion and see if we can come to a conclusion, of, a decision about um, uh, one, two, and three. David, would you mind uh, going back to one of your example uh, slides? Any of them? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so if I could just make a couple of comments to continue setting the stage for those mm -hmm. who might not have been around um, in prior years. And then um, Andrea and Hung, I see that your hands are raised. I wanted to acknowledge that you're, you're on deck for the mic. I think it was back in 2014, a group of us broke out along with uh, CDC members to create that small task force ad hoc thing about a link order code to come up with some, some guiding rules on, uh, on, on features of what makes a, a panel within LOINC. And when it came to the chemistries, uh, it, for, like that, um, the first one that you have there, there would always be, if, if there was some sort of a ratio of course, you had to measure the two analytes separately in order to get to the ratio. So that was kind of inferred that if I'm ordering, if I'm really interested in the analyte um, uh, harmonized over creatinine or normalized over creatinine, then that could be it. The other uh, op, um, tangent to this is uh, urine chemistries where they're 24 hour and the only other supporting information is the total volume uh, and the number of hours of collection. Um, and at that moment, we had um, come to an agreement where rather than build a bunch of chemistry panels, we would go ahead and use the MRAT 24 hour um, observation as an order observation for let's say uh, a mercury uh, in 24 hour urine. Um, that's separate, uh, just an individual mercury, not a heavy metal panel. Um, and I think if you look back to wherever in the timeline, the assignment of that first one, 55255-4, um, is to 2014. And if you were to kind of put these, the timeline of when each of these were created along that, you might see that there had been some development up, you know, 2000, I think we started order codes about 2006, 2008. Um, and and as that moved forward until we, we kind of realized what this was starting to look like and we didn't want to get too far down in the weeds on these. So um, there is a section in the user's guide that has to do with that, um, that task force and what they had found. And I know that those of us that were at the meeting or on the task force, we started implementing that, you know, use the single calculation to become the order like you saw in some of those, but I'm just wondering if there just wasn't enough education for people who came along after 2014 to continue on that line. And I'll be quiet and Andrea, if you want to take the floor and then Hung will be after her. Yeah, um, I just wanted to highlight, you know, some of the things that Pam was saying, and thank you for being on this example with the perineal uh, delene panel. Um, I would expect that you would have the perineal delene level the creatinine level as specified and the ratio as Pam was explaining because you need to have the two individual analytes and then they're used as a calculation to for the ratio. And there's also regulatory requirements like with CAP and you know doing your um, checks of calculations and stuff for CLIA. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're built separately, um, typically in the LIS system and then reported. Now, I know when we had the discussion that Pam was talking about that there are some labs that for a timed urine, they may not report out like the um, 
spot, you know, creatinine level or the calcium level, and it may be just the 24 hour interpretation. Um, so that final ratio or calculated might be reported, but they might be built internally and still utilized in the LIS system for the calculation, et cetera. Um, I think that, you know, professionally that um, from a best practice that kind of the, um, like the perenolane panel is, and if you had the separate uh, perenolane level, that that would be kind of the panel. I also note that in fire discussions, um, as we think about what this could look like either downstream in the EHR or other systems now with a lot of the um, ONC and interoperability um, uh, initiatives that a lot of people are trying to take lab results and put them like in the diagnostic report, et cetera. And there's been a discussion with some of the fire leads that some have a different notion of what a panel is. From a lab perspective, it's typically when you have more than one analyte or component reported. So um, the smallest ones are usually two. Um, I would frown against doing the ratio as an order um, code because it's really not. Um, it, it depends on how it's structured and you know, like I said, from the regulatory aspects. So I would um, favor kind of the, this panel of adding the perenolene level from a structure perspective. Um, and then that way too, if we get into the situations where, you know, one lab adds, you know, something else plus the perenolene and creatinine or, you know, there's, there, you don't have to create new panel order codes if they might have three, four, five items in the panel, depending on the laboratory, um, it should help reduce the work on the LOINT team, et cetera, from an interoperability perspective, kind of like we're talking about with the genomics aspects. But I'll pause there for now and-, and um, uh, yeah. so Andrea, I'll just respond. Yeah, I'll just yeah. respond quickly to some of that. I, mean, I, think, I think you make some really good points because in reality, the questions that, that come to me, I mean, I haven't done this in a long time as far as using you know, this inf kind of information, but to what extent maybe some clinician uses the concentration for one of these things instead of the, you know, and then the concentration is a relevant clinical parameter instead of just the ratio to creatinine. So, you know, to, to kind of call it a secondary result might not be really the right thing to do. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't know the answer to those questions and I don't know if we can answer those questions in every case. Um, or find answers, you know, that's, so that's one, one issue with our proposal right there that you pointed out is that if the lab is going to report multiple things, um, we, we can call them associated observations, but if, if they're, how do we know they're not primary observations? I guess, I guess that's one concern. And I think that's one thing that maybe this committee can help, help us with as well right now. And, um, you know, and yeah, I mean, that's basically, that's basically the core of it. Uh, I, see it. I think, I think this, the, the, the use case here is a little more straightforward in, in the case of, um, you know, like an, an antibody test where there's a quantitative value and then there's interpretation positive or negative, because that's really just a direct link to this. You know, it's not even, you know, it's sort of like, okay, here's your result. And then this is what it means. So I can see more using the order code, the quantitative value of the order code in this case than in this case, but I want to see what, you know, what um, other input we get. Hung yeah. had his hand, then mm -hmm. Rob, then John, then Stan. Sure. Lots of input. Go ahead, Hung. Oh boy, you've opened up a can of worms. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> one, one example I, I don't see up here would be the lupus anticoagulant. And so currently that is built as a panel it looks like, um, but really it's broken down into uh, different components that if either the uh, uh, lupus screen or the diamond viper, uh, diamond Russell viper uh, uh, is positive, then the overall interpretation is positive. And so it's, it's really the overall interpretation that is most important. The, the, the different components themselves um, really contribute to that, but aren't necessarily standalone components, unlike a real panel, which what I would consider like a CBC or a Chem 7, where they are measured at the same time on the same specimen, but they're, um, they don't interact, 
I, I wouldn't consider them interacting with uh, right. necessarily with the other components versus something like the lupus anticoagulant where the different components determine the overall interpretation, but the overall interpretation is really the primary result. Mm -hmm. if, if, if one of those two are positive, it really doesn't matter to me that one of them was negative. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think your comments are really critical to what we're trying to uh, get an answer to here. And that's whether is a panel, um, multiple pieces of information assembled, and I'm sorry for this alarm going off at the wrong time, are, are, is a panel, multiple pieces of information that can, that really are leading to a single clinical um, interpretation, or is a panel multiple pieces of of information that each has their own clinical interpretation. And I, I mean, I think that's what we're getting at, but let's hear what other, what you and other folks have to say um, regarding that. Thanks for, thanks, Han. Yeah, so, um, so clearly part of what's going on and I'm, I'm looking at this kind of from outside in, I haven't been as engaged as the rest of you on this, but, uh, I have always been a little bit confused, maybe. I don't know if that's really the right, right phrase, but you know what panels are intending to try and communicate. So the CHEM7 is a great example, like some of these are, where the, the panel is a collector and there isn't a CHEM7 result. There is a series of individual results that the, the panel just collects them together and and we see that obviously a lot um and um it has a kind of mental mindset around it these so so tell me if if, if i'm right or wrong about these but um the is there for the you know for the for the zika example i mean each of those things sorry not the zika but the uh the COVID example each of them was a you know gets a actual result they have some meaning and um and but but i'm not sure about the ones that you were just showing before where uh, when we made panels for things that particularly the creatinine you know any kind of a ratio example those ratio examples I, i'm assuming that the panels that collected together the various components of the ratio the panel code that's being used as the ordering thing doesn't get a result Right, because each of these show the re the ratio as a separate resulted thing, and so the panel again is a collector, but um, but is not ever resulted, and so so I think um, while you know these certainly act like the way I think panels act, they also could easily fall into the pattern of um you have a series of let's use that phrase supporting observations that um you know that's not like a chem 7 and it gets to the point that was just made it's that they are in fact the pieces that were necessary sometimes you know one or the other like the last example um that are necessary to go together and and so in that situation, my question is, do we need to have a panel in order to communicate that all of these things have to go together? Or is that in some way always obvious? I think with the, with the ratio ones, it probably is because you can see that there's these two measured analytes and then there's a ratio response. And so I'm I'm wondering if in cases, and I think maybe this was your proposal, where you've got straightforward, very clear examples like creatinine, or maybe there's some other ones. I don't know if, um, you know, I, again, I think that maybe that's why you got that question mark on these last two, whether it's as clear or uh, as it is, you know, that's the one test that's the ratio doesn't say both the components that are you expect to see and therefore you need a panel to bring it all together i mean is that part of what we're trying to figure out what is the criteria by which the information is communicated i think that's exactly what we're trying to figure out yeah and um just 
parenthetically, this first panel is not, it's not clear to me why this panel does not include the pyridinyl in concentration. Um, uh, it, it doesn't, I, it looks a little bit mis, misformed. I mean, I know we can re replace moles with mass in panels and that's sort of a, an allowed by, allowed by business rules, but why the creatinine is mass and the pyridinoline of a creatinine is molar, you know, so there's some questions about this panel already, um, but I think your point is exactly right. In a case like this, where it's very clear that you need you know, pyridinylene and creatinine to calculate this ratio, maybe if this is what you're looking for, then that can be the order. Um, right, right. Uh, I mean, that, that's a pretty straightforward rule that I think that we could make. It doesn't maybe fix all of these issues. And so, uh, again, I'm, I'm wondering, is there is there a need, for example, with the Fragile X example to say FMRP cells per 100 lymphocytes explicitly. And, and I think if I, maybe the rule would be that if you do, then you make a panel. Yeah. Yeah, and I think some, uh, one of the other inputs I would like to see from this group if I can is, so is this a, like pyridinylene over creatinine ratio, is that ratio always what you're, I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm thinking of a case where someone might use the pyridinylene concentration and say, well, that's, in, you know. It's a good question, David. Why don't we hear yeah. from John and then Stan? Sure. Absolutely. Pamela, um, I, I was just going to point out and kind of support where Rob was going with the, uh, the quantitative calculated ratio. Uh, items is now I know that the orders observation flag may or may not be actively maintained, but essentially with having these having a panel and then putting the ratio as a result, um, the ratio link code for the example with the uh, perlinidine and creatinine that's set as a both, and we're basically saying that we're invalidating what we're stating in the order observation flag by having that stated as both because we're pushing it into a position where it's only being used as a result. So yeah. I think we need to balance out what we're stating in the order observation flag uh, versus mm -hmm. how these are built. Yeah, okay, that's a good point, John, because if you can order a pyridinylene over creatinine concentration, how can you order that without first measuring period? How can you result that without first measuring both? components. So clearly that's a, just the fact that it's an order means it has to be ordered as, I mean, you have to perform both tests. So an additional question in there, I, I saw this out on Twitter the other day from Tricor Labs is if you do a measurement, let's say someone's doing uh, albumin over creatinine ratio, do you also report back the uh, individual measurements or do you just give them the ratio? So I'm going to go back to that conversation and see what Dr. Grenache found out. But um, Stan. Yeah, uh, very interesting discussion. It seems to me that there are you know, two rational ways to do it. One, one is make panels for all, <laughs> or the other is I think uh, sort of what Rob was saying. Uh, you, you make a panel when uh, the, uh, the associated results have to be interpreted in light of that thing, like a lupus uh, anticoagulant test, et cetera. And you don't make panels when uh, you just have, when, when there are necessary measurements to uh, produce the, the ratio result, but each of those has uh, valid, uh, physiologic interpretation, whether it was, whether it was done as part of the creation of the ratio or not. And I favor that second thing, not making panels for everything, because if you make panels for everything, then you're going to have confusion between, between the panel and, and the name of the ratio result, if you will. Yep. And so I would, 
I would favor that second thing that you make you make panels when when there's uh, uh, a dependency between the the pieces of information that you're using to make a final interpretation versus uh, the situation where the measurements that you made can stand independent and be used independent of the of the fact that you calculated ratio. So, uh, and I think yeah, I think that's a really helpful rule. the The question that would come to us is how do we know the answer to that question? It's um, it's usually pretty easy. I mean, none of these are in question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think these. So if we're looking at this, I guess the original question from the submitter. These basically then would all be the order code, the ratio. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Andrea, you had your hand raised, and there had been a, a reminder from Tim that anything that's in the chat is not recorded for posterity. So, did you want to make some comments about what you had in chat so we have it recorded in the conversation? Sure. Sorry, I forgot to take my hand down, but yeah. Um, in response to Tim's point. Um, so it's correct. I know there's a couple of questions that came up and I know Pam, you kind of answered some too, is there's kind of four different types of uh, orders. There can be a single order and result like a potassium you order and you could have the order obsolete code on it. And then the result is a single potassium with the value, you know, 4.2, whatever it is, numeric. And you can add in the um, that order obsolete code and use it for either the order um, or the result slash component slash observation um, in your builds. But then things like a CBC, I say Rob also pointed out, those are never results, they're always orders. Um, and it's, as Rob talked about, it's like a collection of, of results and that's what's ordered. Um, so that's kind of like a simple panel. And then there's more, um, as Stan was just describing with um, great example of one of the most complex reflexives um, that those are, you order one thing and depending on the results in that initial order, you might have things automatically added on, um, sub orders, if you will. Um, and it can go out depending on the rules and the process and those are reflexive orders. And then the other thing that a lot of laboratories use, especially reference labs are physician convenience orders. So you might have a stroke panel. So a physician can order with one click a CBC, a BMP, and like a PTI and R, and they explode out into the individual sub orders and sub results. Um, and that could go out for a couple of levels too, depending, but those are the kind of four types of orders. And then those would be mapped to the order op, the order only, or um, in the case of the single order, single result, the order observation link code. The revert, but you would never map an order panel code to a single result link code um, or observation only link code. And then the opposite is true. So if you're looking at results only, you wouldn't want to map it to like a CBC order code um, because the individual result for hemoglobin hematocrit, they would have their own individual link codes for those result components. Um, so I don't know if that helps clarify for those who had questions about the different types of links. There's order links, order only links, observation only links, an order slash observation that can use for those single items. Um, and then for the basic lab structure, you typically have orders and you have results. <laughs> so um, some EHRs, they have orders that you fill a dictionary and map to the link codes. And then you have a separate dictionary where you have result components and you map to the link codes. Other EHRs and LISs might have them um, combined into a single dictionary by a lab area. So all your um, microbiology, for example, be in one dictionary and your um, main lab might have been another dictionary and all your pathology is in another dictionary. And so there's a distinction in those dictionaries of which items are orders and results. So you can map the links accordingly too. So it really depends on the EHR LIS structure. But it's something that we need to make sure there's a fundamental understanding of this structure because otherwise you're gonna have people that are gonna try and map panels, which are really orders from a lab perspective to the wrong link code potentially. And I know this is a huge thing in fire as they're trying to do diagnostic report. Um, 
and trying to structure out observations. There's a lot of different terminology and meaning behind some of this as we're moving forward. So it, it's something that's still work in progress when we're working on interoperability, but I'll pause there. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So let's see if I'm getting this right. Uh, let me just go back to the presentation. Okay. Um, I, I kind of threw this, uh, I think this, this is kind of modified based on, on Stan's comment. Um, I don't know if I got all the grammar right because I did it kind of quickly, but so this would be the updated, this would be our updated statement in cases where a single result is reported along with secondary results upon which it is dependent, but, can, but where those secondary results cannot stand alone on their own, the LOIC code assigned to the primary result should be used as the order code. Does that sound right? Would we agree on that as a policy? I think that's what I heard as well. We just clean up the grammar part of it. Yep. Um, cases where a single result is reported at once. The secondary result doesn't make sense from a lab perspective. Supportive information, maybe? Well, it's, um, it's, it's, see, the thing is, it's not really supportive information it's yeah it's essential measurements that are needed to calculate the final result uh and i th i think this is stated backwards uh we we use the um when in the case so if yeah in in the case where they can stand alone you just use the um, the ratio measurement as the order code. In the cases where the you have information, I, 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 see if I can explain it by reference to other things. For instance, if you think of the structure of um, a, a medication order, uh, you you know you have as part of that order, the drug that's being ordered, the dose, the route, and other stuff. The dose, the route, and the other stuff can't stand alone. They don't have any meaning if you don't know the drug that's being ordered. So those are, those, if you will, are, uh, they're, they're necessary information, but there's no way you can interpret a dose independent of, of the, of the drug. And so in the lab, if there are, you know, in a situation where it's important to know that it's being done on the same sample and that these things were all done in sequence and you, and then you have an intellectual process. It's not a, not a calculation, but uh, a reasoned result from that that says they're, you know, positive or negative or something like that. Right. Those should be panels. Uh, but, and, and I mean, like I said, it's, <laughs> The options we're talking about is we make panels for everything, uh, and that's that's consistent. But then it creates confusion when uh, you know whether you ordered the panel or whether you ordered the individual uh, ratio test. The set of results that come back are the same, and the and the naming of them will look almost identical, except for the name panel. Uh, so, I don't know if that clarifies it. It's it's the you use the um, yeah you would use the ratio when what um, when the results need to be measured in order to create the calculation and they have meaning whether whether they were used in a calculation or not uh, then just order the order the ratio code and you'll get back the ratio and and each of the measurements that were used in making that calculation and in the other case you know you, you order the panel and what comes back is actually you know you would you would have a panel uh, a panel code and then you would have all of the results that are dependent inside of that inside of that panel and it, it is a different kind of panel than a chem 7 or something else because the Chem 7 guys, they all stand alone uh, to
too. You know, the it, that potassium isn't it doesn't provide more information by knowing that it was part of a panel. A path, you know, a potassium is used independently. Uh, Unless so, there's an anion gap. What's that? Unless there's an anion gap as part of that, that would utilize a calculation in that panel. Right? Well, there's all kinds of, th that doesn't change the interpretation of the potassium. That just right, adds right, additional, right. you're just making an additional calculation. The potassium still stands alone. Uh, so. Right. I know this is getting closer. <laughs> Um, this is it's messy right now, but I think what Stan's highlighting there's different types of panels. Some include mm -hmm. the calculation. Some have you know one to four or five items, and there's an interpretation, and there's an overall interpretation for all those items. So they kind of are grouped. I think the big thing of the panel, and it gets back to kind of what Rob was saying, is they're grouped together. There's inherent meaning and context. I mean, even if you have a CBC, if you know it's, um, you know, with an auto diff, then you know everything that's listed in there is automated. It's not a manual diff. So there's context with some of these orders too. So they have to be together as, you know, as a unit for the interpretation to get the full meaning of the lab test. So it, it still seems backwards. There's just the one word. It, the measurements can stand alone on their own and are necessary to calculate to determine primary result. The, yep. the case you're stating is the reason that you would have uh, a, a panel. Yeah, that's, yeah, you're stating there. Yeah, your, your statement as writ currently written would be the, the logic for when you, when you create a panel. And we probably need two statements. We need to, you know, we need the statement that this is what you do when um, you have to make the measurements and the measurements have independent clinical value, uh, then just use the, you know, just use the order code. And then the other situation is the, the way this read initially. Um, so. Yeah, okay, I think, I think that what, my backwards thinking was coming from was that I'm thinking of standing alone on their own, meaning uh, that they can be interpreted independent, which is, I think, what you just said. Yeah. Okay. Wapna, did you have an additional comment? Yeah, I'm actually just uh, a little confused. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. So can sense. we just, can we look at the examples and just go through each one and say, okay, based on the discussion so far, we would make a panel or we wouldn't make a panel for this? Because I just, I'm not quite sure where we're landing. Yeah, can, you, can you, let's see, how do we make it bigger so I can actually read? Uh, so this one, there would be no panel. Okay. Yeah, so I would the, agree with that. Me too. So, so for this, basically the ratios where you have the two analytes that are used to calculate the final result, you would not have the panel. So right. I would disagree because from a lab perspective, you know, when you have to do the calculations and stuff from a CLIA and stuff and how you're defining things, those all go together. You'd have a calcium, you know, it's probably a calcium creatinine or, you know, whatever you're going to call the panel like you did with the um, perimaline, sorry, I'm mispronouncing it. And then you'd have the calcium as an individual result, creatinine an individual result, and the ratio is an individual result. And all three together go together. So it's a panel. Well, I understand they, but what you're that's saying, the, Andrea. That's, I mean, that's exactly but, the point, though, is that um, it doesn't matter that it's a panel. I mean, you, you need the three results. There's no question about that. But right. the, the calcium doesn't need to be grouped under the calcium ratio because the calcium can be interpreted uh, independent of whether it was part of that uh, part of the panel or not, quote unquote. The issue from ordering is a physician cannot order the calcium creatinine ratio on its own but without this is the just other an, two. An identifier of what is intended, the lab catalog from the local laboratories providing service to that clinician indicates clearly what all will be provided. And 
one of the stretches I really had to get to early on in my LOINC career was understanding that the steps needed to build an LIS um, compendium does not have to be mimicked exactly with the LOINC codes. Right, but there has to be a definition of what's in the panel. And there's three, re three result items but here. But that's that are the in that business panel. use case from the laboratory, the local laboratory. So there's a third variable in here that the clinician also has a service agreement with. There's a business handshake there. I'm going to order from your catalog. And they provide a catalog that says everything that will be done with each urine sample that's given under that order. Right. But there's also a distinction because CLIA handles orders and results differently too. In, in what way? Well, I in mean, from when, you, when, you, when, you, when your lab defines their panels, however, they're defining them, what's involved in each, because some might call it a CBC and include a platelet and others may call it a CBC and exclude a platelet count, that how each individual lab determines which results are part of that quote order panel um, that's part of the specimen collection catalog and such. And that's part of like EDOS and um, order catalog in FIRE and those specifications too, because you, again, the lab will build them because if one has four components, the other one has five, you, you know, the physician has to know when they're ordering what's part of it. And part of that's in that CLIA specimen collection catalog. But those are two different notions, if you will, even though they're called the same thing too. That's why we have different LOINC codes for, like, I think that's the hemogram without the platelet and then the CBC with the platelet, but don't quote me on that. I might have flipped those. Can we define clearly what are the implications of having something declared a panel and not declared a panel in the LOINC um, system? I think we're getting bogged down in nomenclature, but what are the real world implications of building a panel versus not building a panel? I think that's a good question. I mean, we have labs out there that have used the order code as we're proposing. Um, and I don't, you know, I can't think of an implication of it right now. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if we, you know, Jamie, would you say that we could I mean, we have the structure of associated observation. Does that help us here? Uh, it could. <laughs> yeah. um, I think Hung, he really highlights the primary question is when do we build a panel and when do we not? Um, when do we encourage people to use the, you know, the ratio code, like in this instance, as the order? Um, Yeah, from a practicality, if you're trying to query this line code for this example of the calcreatinine ratio, you know, with the order, it basically is, is telling you there's three things involved in it. But if you're looking at the result only, there's only one item. And so there's even a, you know, zero to one or zero to three or one to, you know, numeric difference of what's coming back to. And I know we talked about some of this, I think, with um, some of the quality measures with fire, with um, Floyd Eisenberg at one point, because, you know, if you're querying, sometimes it's easier to query a CBC and get all the result components that come back with it, as opposed to having to query each individual result item. But in this case, if you're using the same link to mean one item versus three items, you're going to get different queries and results. How are you going to know well, that's correct? You, you made the wrong trade-off in that now you're to implementation and that's that's a bad implementation because if you want all potassiums you you know and you stored and you can only access them through the panel that they were ordered in you cause yourself a whole bunch more work than uh, than you would have if you if you stored them as individual results and then knew you know in our implementations we actually store them both way. We store them as a panel so we know exact results that were, that, that were done together. And then we actually break out each one in a different table so that the individual independent observations are available. And so, but now we're into database design instead of naming. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Stan, from the sense of you can query in the, the order code in this example, 139, 134908 for the order to get only the order portion or you can query on the result called 134911 to get only the result portion. But if you're querying on the LOINC code, 
you're going to get both, right? Because it's been mapped to both in this particular example. Yeah, I mean, uh... and I'm only mentioning it because um, with my current um, clinical um, decision support tool work with we're using link codes for results as part of the um, problem concept maps, we've encountered this a couple of times with some things too. So you want to make sure we're only getting results and have the appropriate context if we're using link independent on link too. And of course, if there's no link, then that's an issue too, but that's another story. Yeah, I, um, well, again, it can, unfortunately, I need to, I got a conflict, so I need to jump, but I mean, there are two rational ways to do it. One is make panels for all, <laughs> uh, and, and I would be okay with that, or uh, just, uh, again, the rule would be, I, I can use another example uh, that's, that shows the distinction. If, uh, you know, you've got lots of blood pressures, uh, but for instance, if, if I'm measuring blood pressures that are, are part of uh, a cardiac stress test, uh, then you need to know that to interpret, you know, the heart rates or the blood pressures because you need to know that the patient was exercising at the time that you did that. And so those kind of things that where, where there's, uh, where interpreting the meaning of, of the data requires the context of the other measurements, then that should be a panel. In the situation where I just wanna have vital signs and there's a heart rate and the blood pressure and other things measured, uh, you know, you, you, well, it, it, that's just like a chem seven, uh, you know, for, for, for the lab results. And in this, in this case, there's a dependence and you, you, I think you make a good point, Andrea, that, that others have answered too, that, you know, the clinician ordering, uh, or ordering the ratio needs to be aware of what's going to be measured in order to create the result that he asked for, or she asked for. Right. Uh, but you know, that's, that's always known, <laughs> you know what you have to measure to, to do a, you know, a creatinine ratio or whatever ratio it is. Uh, and whether you, whether you create a panel in order to encapsulate that, you could do that in the lab system. Uh, I don't think it's essential. And again, the, the, the only downside I see to making panels for everything is that people will type in, okay, I want a creatinine ratio, you know, a, a a calcium creatinine ratio and two things will come up a panel <laughs> well i guess the only thing that would come up in in your scenario is 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 the panel would come up and then they would then you'd have to tell them somehow anyway that you're going to do these other two measurements so i didn't i'm not right, seeing a right. huge difference between these two but yeah it looks like dan has his hand up too but i appreciate your comments too stan okay thank you stan yeah. See you later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. To to further to kind of tie what Stan was saying and back to Hung's question and to try to simplify a few things. Um, you know, one principal difference between like panels and, for example, these ratio terms, right? As we say, you know, a panel term is not ever expected and shouldn't carry a result value, uh, but it's. But it's not true, you know. The reverse isn't isn't necessarily true. Where we we never said like the um, the ratio couldn't sort of fulfill that role. Um, so the the caveat or the the challenge there is in in what Stan was just saying is if we have two things, this is the sort of practical implication. We have two things that look, for all intents and purposes, very similar, like a ratio term, except one is a panel and one is not. We often see mismappings or misuse of those panel terms to actually carry results, which is, you know, sort of troublesome. I would say maybe, you know, there's a lot of different issues here and I can think of a variety of other scenarios, but one focus point maybe is just in terms of these, I'll call them quote unquote simple ratios where 
you know, the term sort of says what components are expected or used, you know, to calculate it. And then to sort of make the inference that in the case where there is such a ratio term, you know, we won't build a panel and it's assumed or implied that those subsequent things are, you know, are going to come along. Um, be, because the minute you would get into, well, there might be some other related measurement, um, then you need a panel. But in this sort of inference case where there's a, um, where there's a described set of uh, pieces that go into it, then to me that does seem pretty straightforward. Um, but I, I worry um, about the, the, the implication of having these sort of dual nature or you know, very, very similar terms, um, the ratio term as a measurement and then the, the panel term that looks like a ratio. Okay, thanks, Dan. Was there a, was there another comment, uh, Pam? Is there another? There's not a comment, but there is a question. Um, Chris Jeffries states that they're fairly new to LOINC. Is there a reason why the code for a calculated value is not explicitly defined by the LOINC codes representing the inputs to the calculation? Have panels been used as a proxy for this? Um, the calculations are really hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm trying to understand the question. Is there a reason why the code for a calculated value, such as the ratio, right, is not explicitly defined by the line codes representing the input? So in other words, is there a an explicit definition in LOINC that says there's a formula, formula that one line code over the other produces this one? And you know, LOINC does have a field for form formula, and the formula field does not have LOINC codes in it because there are different LOINC codes that could be used in that calculation per se. But um, in general, I would say that formula is, you know, is there, and you could it's an, although not mapped to LOINC codes within the formula, it's kind of implied. So something simple like a ratio, however, might not have a formula because the formula is actually in the in the component. Jamie had her hand up too. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to add that, um, you know, looking across labs and how they report this, the other thing that my, the reason why I feel like having the order code be the ratio code in, in these instances is that not all labs report all three values. Some just report the ratio. And for interoperability, it would be ideal for across labs to have that same order code for the same test. Um, in which case, you know, if the ratio is always reported out, that would be, that would be the one. So, uh, yeah, I think we have to come to a, you know, some sort of resolution of this. Um, so, and, you know, we've heard opinions and, and, you know, evidence and, you know, good discussion on both sides. I think my sense of the consensus is, you know, and I kind of agree with it right now, is that we should in this particular case of these creatinine ratio terms, follow this kind of model where the ratio term is the order because you cannot possibly report this without calculating this and this. And if these are resulted, then they're resulted and they'll be in the, you know. So I, while I can understand on the other hand from my, you know, lab medicine background that I can see the value of sort of modeling it as a panel because that's the way the result is produced um, from a structural standpoint. You know, conceptualizing it here, I can see that that could create some concern um, of having two equivalent or almost equivalent because in, in reality, this sort of is almost a panel code by default, even if even though it's an order, you know, yeah. I, I think we, we I think we see you know misuse of and and sort of a blended use of of those two uh, to the extent that we'd actually cause more harm than good. That's just my sense right now. So you know, getting back to our proposal, do you think we could agree that at least for now we would suggest using this the ratio primary result term as the order code in these particular cases of creatinine ratio, um, you know, pending, you know, some undeniable evidence that that causes harm 
Can, can we agree on that? Do you think? I, I don't. I don't know how to produce how to vote or you know. I don't think we planned on doing any sort of a poll. Uh, April, do we have any capability of doing that or? Um, um, not necessarily on the fly, but we can do a raise hand functions for our panelists oh, and get sure. a, I, a general group I just feeling. Want to add to that first bullet though that it's not it's not a new thought. It was proposed as the Aloink order codes that's um, that was done back in 2014, and the long termer mappers uh, have probably been doing it. But mm. we need to do do some sort of education. Uh, for right. the people that have entered the arena since then. Right, and Pam, I'm sorry if we didn't bring that up um, in this discussion. Um, I think your your determination also affected 24 hours, which we're primarily focusing today on the, on the uh, randoms. Um, yeah, and Pam, if you could uh, send us that, I had looked through the final report um, from that and wasn't able to find the I know. exact text. I was so, looking too, I'm gonna yeah. have to journal hard drive from the last least laptop and try to see where notes yeah. are, but I don't think it made it actually into the final report. So maybe, maybe yeah. just letting it read as a suggestion here, lets that take over because it, it hasn't been exactly emphasized in the user's guide, even though it yeah, was an I, understood well, notion from the participants. And I didn't recall that decision to you, Pam. I, 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 I know we had the discussion about the 24 hour urines and I thought we just left it that you know, for the, at least for the 24 hour urines that there are different ways that labs might report it and that's okay from the results side. I have a feeling it was one of those discussions where there was a lot of time spent on one aspect and then one of us threw it up to Clem and said, hey, well, what about this other one? Can we do that? And he goes, yep. And, there, and, and we let the so session go on. <laughs> Where's Clem? I know, I miss him. The, uh, the other thing I might suggest though is too, maybe because we didn't, uh, carry through or because it's still ex there still are some that that sort of don't fit that model the question remains right you're like because people look and they find patterns and they find some panels that you know are still sort of floating out there um, and so I, I feel like su uh, suggestions one and two kind of have to go together um, yep I agree so should we get um can we get a hand raise on um, on Yes, for bullet, primary bullets one and two. Can we precisely clarify exactly what we are voting on that suggesting that using the ratio prim primary result term as the order code, is this for the ones that we discussed or specifically the ratio term? Uh, oh, thank you. Um, so, I think, well, I can't edit because I'm in presentation mode, but I, I think we can, um, I, let's keep it, let's keep it simple and keep it to the examples we were discussing with respect to the creatinine ratio terms for, because uh, this way we can get, you know, some solid, hopefully agreement on that. Okay, so we are saying specifically for those creatinine ratio terms, that's what we're discussing for these points one and two, yep. or just point one. Uh, and two. One and two. Okay, so we'll do a raise hands that are in support, and then we'll lower those hands and do a quick um, nay vote as well. I see an attendee with a raised hand. Are you? Uh, this is for the committee member vote. So if you're not a committee member, please uh, refrain from raising your hands. Brittany is with Mayo, so let's see okay. if Dr. Yao yields his vote to her. I think she's his delegate. Okay. So go, yeah, go ahead and toss that up there and we'll take a quick look here. Okay, well, um, we have um, about seven in the pro. Uh, and so we'll go ahead and Jennifer, can we lower all those hands please? And then We'll go ahead and anybody strongly opposed? Well, seeing crickets, no hands going up. So it's looking like that is the general consensus. 
and nobody is strongly against it. So David, do you want to confirm what we are moving forward with? Yes, we are moving forward with, in the case of the ratio to creatinine urine terms, we will suggest use of the primary result term as the order code. And we will review LOINC for existing panels that fit that criteria that have been created before and discourage use um, of those panels. And we will, um, we, I guess we didn't actually include bullet three in our vote, but I guess we would, we would need to update the user's guide to describe this decision. I have a question about that. Yes. On the user guide, the whole mm -hmm. idea of a single primary result, I think is confusing because they're all results when you think about it, um, as we were discussing. So I know what Sienna was trying to say was along with other measurements, but maybe along with other results that can stand alone on their own and take out primary and single result or just, you know, when a result can be. Okay, I, yeah, I, I, I'll, um, Andrea, maybe we, you could help us word that when we put yeah. it in, because I, yeah. I think I mean, we, we want to capture what we said, and I think the committee would be okay if we capture it grammatically correctly, but I think you make a good point, and I can't edit this um, pre presentation screen, but um, I, I yeah, know what you're- Yeah, just keep it for the minutes and, and, and follow up later, that's fine. So thank okay, you. great, thank you. And David, sorry, this is Swapna, I didn't mean to interrupt, Thanks. but um, I think since we've only voted on the creatinine ratio terms, I think the wording in the user's guide should be limited to that, unless we go on right now to talk about more of it, but I, I don't think we should put in a general statement if we've only discussed and voted on the creatinine ratios. Right, I agree. Yep. Right. right. To follow with what Swap is saying, can I uh, make a, a notion that we take up the rest of the ratio link codes at a future meeting? Yes, sounds good. I agree with that too. And I, I think that, um, We'll probably continue on with the the April meeting, which unfortunately is closed to the public. Uh, so it's only for the committee members. So um, I guess any input that a public member might want to say, please go ahead and, and email it into the lab committee at loink.org just so we can be informed of your opinion. Great, okay. So I think we are settled on, um, or we can close this up. Would we agree to that? So, David, do you want a break in talking for a bit? <laughs> um, just... Oh, no, that, well, okay. it's okay. I mean, I, I, if people want a break from hearing my voice, I can't, I couldn't blame them Not for that. at all. Um, I'm thinking that, that I'm gonna table, we've got 45 minutes left and I'm, thinking to table the discovery session from the lab uh, reference lab members on their referral labs progress of adopting LOINC because that's just kind of an altruistic goal of getting all labs mapped. We'll just table that for now. Um, and for the committee updates, um, I have you, David, for the value set work groups and then Dr. Yao for an update from Mayo. Uh, if anyone else has something that they would like to um, oh, and I guess the only other thing then, if we have any time, I'd just like to see if there's any additional considerations of the mapper certification question that we posed on Tuesday. Oh, Pam, we also have Leanna Harmon with an update as well. Oh, very well. Thank you. Sorry, Leanna. Yeah. So Leanna, if you'll go after Dr. Yao. So we'll have David, Dr. Yao, and then Leanna. Okay, so should I, should I share? Go right ahead. Okay, so um, this hopefully will be quick. It's just really an, an update. So we've had our first meeting um, of the Loink Value Sets um, work group or task force. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give us give a sense of what we accomplished in that meeting. We really just did an introduction, but I just I want to kind of give a briefer version of that introduction and invite um, other members to become involved if they are so interested. So Loink- uh, David, are you sharing? Uh, maybe I'm not. There we go. Perfect, thanks. 
Okay, there's a, that final button you have to. Okay, um, so so I think the so Loink when Loink you know came along obviously Loink has multiple ways of of modeling groups of things and aggregations of things. I shouldn't use the word groups since groups is one of the ways that Loink groups things. So there are panels, um, groups, hierarchies, buyer value sets, ontology, there's answer lists. So these are these are just, you know, a set of ways that Loink has developed to create aggregates of stuff. And I think we're at a point where we want to step back and look at all these evolving ways of creating aggregates of things and say, okay, what are the types of aggregates? Like just kind of take a nice sampling maybe and um, looking at the methods we have of aggregating things and, and trying to map those two things together. The use cases to the, the models and see what models fit the best use cases and come up with some sort of policy for this type of thing will be grouped this way in LOINC. Um, that's really the objective of this work group. Um, so, you know, just to sh show a little bit about pa panels could be collections of things that are ordered together or used for a common purpose. You know, these are convenience panels or just organize organizational panels. So panels are used for different types of collections in LOINC. Um, then, then there are groups, which basically is a, intended to be this flexible and extensible mechanism for rolling up groups of LOINC codes for various purposes. Um, and that's another way that grew out of, um, you know, the need to hold things together in LOINC. Um, then there's the multi-axial hierarchy, which is a way to collect things based on the component hierarchy and then kind of add in class and system uh, to those nodes. Um, then, of course, we have our ontology. We have the document ontology.owl. So by using an ontological structure, which is based on the five hierarchies of the five axes, we can then group things in those multiple axes that fit together as intersections of those axes. Um, and then we have answer lists, which are groups of answers that could be um, that basically replies to a specific link term, which is a question and defined as an answer list. Um, then there are, there are fire value sets, which are defined in LOINC. Some of those come from, maybe could come from groups or come from some of these other methods or some of them just are, or come from tags that are assigned to LOINC terms. Then on the other side, on the other side of the coin, there are the types of collections that you can make. There are things that are ordered together, as we've said, things that are actually sort of almost equivalent, equivalent from some use case perspective. Um, there are things that could be broader and narrower. There are things that are related in some other way. I'm just being general here. There are possible answers to the same question. There are a subset of links that apply to a specific area of study or area of, of clinical medicine. So how these things map together, how this slide maps to this slide is really what we're trying to come up with an answer to. Do any of these need to go away? Do we use groups for everything and sort of like put ontological data into groups? I mean, so those are the kinds of questions we want to answer um, over the next um, six months to a year, I would say. Um, I don't think we have a specific timeline, uh, but we do want to come up with some sort of consensus. The next meeting is April 6th at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And what we're asking for at that meeting is if group member, members of this work group could please bring some use cases for aggregations of data that we could start to look at in the context of, of some of the collections we've mentioned. And maybe there are other kinds of collections that we didn't mention. So we can begin to consider how the best model of link would look. And if you bring use cases, you're welcome to bring a short slide presentation um, as well. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Might we get um, uh, people to let Reagan Streep know that they would like to be involved? Absolutely. We welcome um, the participants in that group. Um, Where would I, you like them to email? 
Yeah, so let me defer to um, April on that. What would you, uh, what do you think would be a good um, email to use for expressing interest in the work group? Um, I think at this point we can use meetings at loink.org. Okay, so that's um, meet, meetings at loink.org. Yes, we'll drop it into the chat as well, or the, okay. um, yeah, the chat so all of the activities can see it. There it is. Thank you, David. That looks fascinating. Okay, thank you. Dr. Yao, would you like to present? Hello. Hello. Oh, Dr. Yao, you went away. No, <laughs> there you close, are. I had to close my door, sorry. No worries. Uh, I'm going to share my slides. You're seeing my screen? We are. Okay. Would you like to put it in presentation mode? Yes. Excellent. Perfect. There we go. All right, sounds good. Uh, so I look back and it was uh, October 20th, I think, or 21st was our last LOINC, uh, laboratory LOINC committee meeting. So this would be a six month update from our last presentation. Uh, sorry, October the 13th. So I show here our mapping effort here at Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic Laboratories in the last six months. Um, so this was as of this morning, uh, the number of orderable tests that we have mapped uh, is now up a little bit from six months ago. We're now at 65%, uh, but that represent a 72 uh, test increase from six months ago. We've also obsolete uh, <clears throat> discontinued 153 orderable tests in the last six months. For the referral tests, so these are tests that we send out to external reference laboratories. It represents a 37, uh, number of 37 increase, but no change in the number of discontinued tests. For the resultables in the last six months, uh, we've actually increased 721 resultables. So one given orderable can have multiple resultables. Uh, our average is around uh, one orderable to two and a half resultables. That's kind of the general ratio uh, that we've been seeing. Uh, we've discontinued 21 results. Uh, and for referral external send out test results, we have increased 101 resultables. Now the number of COVID diagnostic tests continue to increase uh, when I presented in October, we were up to here. Uh, so since then, we've actually increased uh, <clears throat> seven more tests. Um, and so now we've also decreased or discontinued some of the older tests uh, due to availability of newer tests and also because of changes in reagents and supplies from the commercial vendors. Uh, so the ones that are crossed out are the ones that we have discontinued. And uh, we are actually adding a sequencing test by Thermo Fisher. It's a next generation sequencing assay uh, at the end of the month. So by the end of the month, we would have a um, total of 18 tests and uh, four of which are serologic tests and the rest are molecular tests. This is the uh, update or trend of the number of tests that we have performed. Uh, back in October, this was the national uh, cases of COVID positive results. You can see that we had a rise in July, around the July 4th uh, holidays. And then in the middle of October, we saw an increase, but that increase really dwarf anything that we had in the previous months. 
So this October increase through Thanksgiving and January was a huge spike uh, nationwide. And we're now back down for the last month, kind of back down to pre-Thanksgiving level. Uh, this graph on the right showed our cumulative total number of tests that we have performed since end of March when we launched our first laboratory developed test here at Mayo. So we're just barely over 4 million tests performed so far, um, almost a one year anniversary. And uh, <clears throat> the orange bar represent the number of positive results. And you can see that the bottom graph shows the number uh, percentage of positivity rate among the 4,000 clients who sends us specimen specimen for testing. Uh, so at the peak, this was around Thanksgiving or shortly before Thanksgiving, it was around 14.5%. Now for the past uh, month or so, we're hovering between three and a half to 5%. Uh, let's hope that with 17 states now removing mandatory masking and social distancing and opening restaurants to 100% capacity, we won't see this going any further. Uh, hopefully offset by the number of people who have received vaccination. So these are actually weekly uh, positivity rates and a weekly cumulative uh, number of tests. Uh, serologic tests uh, are represented in this graph. These are the cumulative number, weekly uh, cumulative number of uh, tests performed. So we're just barely over 250,000 as of this past Monday. And the positivity rate uh, remains around 30% or so, although there's an increased positivity rate represented by the uh, orange line. So it's around 35% or so. Uh, we have ongoing challenges, uh, shortages of reagents and supplies, and they're not limited to COVID testing uh, because a lot of the raw materials and assembly lines in factories are diverted to manufacturing COVID-related supplies and reagents. The routine tests are experiencing shortages um, in other manufacturing and manufacturers. Because of the fluctuation in the number of tests from day to day, we're also having challenges how to adjust our laboratory staff workload to meet these daily changes. And uh, you can see from this slide, during weekends, our tests are around 1,000, but on midweek, we're up to 8,000 a day. Uh, the light blue represent the number of specimens received. Um, and then the dark blue represent the number of specimens that reaches our lab. So there's a bit of a lag. And then the red represent the number of test results reported. So this would represent that we're behind. We couldn't meet uh, the number of tests delivered or received. And then by two days later, uh, when we adjusted our workload, we we're able to meet that demand. So the green line represent the testing capacity based on number of personnel, reagents and equipment time available to meet. So weekend, not a problem. Weekdays um, require some adjustment from day to day. So it makes that very challenging for our lab supervisors and management team. Uh, and also FDA has issued two weeks ago uh, a advisory to all assay manufacturer that um, there are some assays that are adversely affected by the emergence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants. It's affecting their uh, PCR primers and probes. Uh, there are at least three assays now identified uh, being adversely affected by such assays. And so the warning now is for manufacturer to monitor uh, and do sequencing uh, for both the virus and also to look at uh, peptide and proteins that may be altered by the um, encoding genes. Uh, we remain on hold for the HL7 upgrade uh, to 2.5.1 because of the IT constraints. And um, for those of you who have more than two or three Zoom meetings a day, uh, hopefully you're not suffering from Zoom fatigue. I was looking back at my calendar for the past week. Uh, the maximum I had so far in the day was eight separate Zoom meetings. 
and all our IT colleagues remain uh, at home, working from home remotely. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Yao? Not seeing any. Um, Leanna, would you like to take the floor, please? This would be an update from LabCorp. Um, hello, everyone. Um, obviously, I aspire to, to do what Dr. Yao does to bring an update to the LOINC uh, team. Um, I am way behind in this world, but uh, I just did a little bit of data mining over the last few weeks, and this is based primarily on what LabCorp um, publicly has in on their website. And uh, based on that, just percentages wise, we have about 82% of our tests in our directory of services mapped. Um, we get a lot of questions about the, uh, what we call our in, not applicables or NAs in our uh, directory of service. And we have a lot of extraneous uh, result codes that go into building reports that are not actually a result um, to say. so. We have a lot of uh, result codes in the background that don't represent anything. So we do get a lot of questions on that, but um, I'm going to be digging into our full compendium because I could not even begin to tell you how many tests we have unpublished that may or may not be link mapped um, into just my, you know, my predecessor, Cindy, I know she worked tirelessly to get as much done as possible, but our unpublished directory, you know, is probably double or triple what's out on our actual directory of services. So I will be digging into that as well. But uh, I know Pam had posed a question to us about um, send out labs that we don't have links for. And just in my finding, we find more of the smaller boutique labs are the ones that we struggle with getting um, LOINC terms from uh, just one one that came to mind was like MNG laboratories. Um, I reach out to them directly, or some of the just the smaller boutique labs that we struggle with getting LOINC terms from. Um, but Pam, that's really all I have. Sorry, it's not as it is as dynamic as Dr. Yao, but like I say, <laughs> I aspire to be him. We all aspire to be Dr. Yao. <laughs> Be like him. Thank you, Leanna. Um, finally, the unless somebody else has something else that they'd like to put in the q and I just wondered if there were any additional considerations about the certification question that was posed on Tuesday. Anything that we can take notes about uh, and bring back to Marjorie? I know she's double tasking. She might be triple tasking out here in the audience, but Hey, Pam, can I ask Leanna one question, just to follow up? Oh, sure. Thanks. So, Leanna, I was just wondering, um, what does the unpublished catalog represent? Like, are those the tests that are coming? Or, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, if it's double or triple what's um, publicly available? Um, primarily, our unpublished is custom panel. Um, <clears throat> That's the biggest thing I can think of is that like in our toxicology area, we have thousands upon thousands of panels that are customized based on what a physician wants. So those are not all published out there in that directory of service. There may be a general panel that represents that testing, but in the background, it's primarily custom panels that physicians are requesting um, unique testing. Hmm. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um Jenna had her hand raised from ARUP Laboratories. Yeah, we, um, in that kind of regard, we have some tests that are unpublished. Um, there's kind of tests built in the background to handle some workflow issues, but the results on those unpublished tests actually do go out to clients. So we have kind of, we have to decide, do we put low ink codes on those? If no one's going to see them until the result, I think the answer is yes. But I think our past history is that we haven't put in the effort.
Thanks very much, Jenna. Um, I just remember from my time at ARUP laboratories that um, the, the ability to market to a new prospective client um, often led to a lot of um, make, new, make new panels, ordering conveniences, if you will, uh, in order to sway someone to come and become a client. So I'm sorry, Swapna, when I heard unpublished, I, I kind of knew exactly what that was. It doesn't go out in the main catalog, but there's items made for contractual purposes. Any other comments? I did see one from Leanne that she would love to have more education and the ability to get certified in the future. Welcome, Leanne. And I'm just kind of watching to see if anything else comes about. Um, I sure appreciate everyone's time. I hope you found today's discussions very stimulating and thoughtful, thought provoking. The attendance today, uh, for those of you that are in the audience, counts towards a requirement to attend a meeting before you can join the uh, lab committee meeting or the lab committee. So if your organization would like to join, the committee and be involved in our monthly discussions on development, please see the link committee pages for instructions on joining. And I'll just keep the floor open and see if there's some, um, someone else who would like to uh, share with us. Because it's so great to see everyone's face and hear your voices. I truly miss you. Pam, I do have a question. Do we think that we may have in-person meeting in the fall? Well, if you would like to get your passport ready, Xavier's invited us over to his chateau in, in France. Did you see that? <laughs> in November. Okay. It looks right. grand. I'm talking to my husband. We'll see what we can do. Um, I don't qualify for a vaccination yet, so <laughs> we're waiting to see, but that's very exciting. Okay. Yes, Thank everybody, you. everybody get your passports ready. Um, that is the absolute goal is to have this next conference meeting in person to the extent that we are able. So obviously um, time will tell, but we are planning that. We've been planning it for a few months and we have more planning to do. I don't see any more hands up, any comments. There have been um, a few comments in the chat. Great meeting. Um, hope to see everyone in France. Thank you. Yes, we hope to see you too, Xavier. Um, at that lovely chateau, as Pam has called it. It is beautiful if everyone has a chance to check it out. Um, yeah, any, any other follow-up comments? This has been really, um, I think, uh, some complex issues brought up, but certainly some progress forward. All right, well, I'll wave goodbye and Hope you all have a great weekend and we'll see you. So there won't be another lab loink meeting this month. We'll meet in April. Yes, correct. And everyone, Thanks, everyone. Um, just to sort of, um, Pam, thank you so much for leading this. As always, you did a wonderful job. Um, we definitely appreciate your support and your continued commitment to loink. For those of you that are on the lab committee meeting, we will be sending out a reminder of that meeting. Certainly, as I've mentioned before, it is not a calendar invitation, so make sure um, that you create that event on your own calendar and check your junk or spam mail just in case it didn't go there. Uh, and if you don't have that notification within a few days before the meeting, which is April 6th, as Pam mentioned, please let us know. All right, well, with that, we will close and we'll meet back here for a special session from ONC.